I'm absolutely thrilled to see you despite the circumstances. It's really uh, uh, exciting. Uh, I see a lot of faces right now, or I've just seen them. Um, so I'm going to do a small warm up exercise this morning for you. Please put your hands up, as in thumb up, if you're excited to be here. And there's only one option. So you can only put your thumbs up. Wonderful. It's really great to see everyone. Bonjour. Good morning, hello. Um, I'm absolutely thrilled, as I said, and I'm absolutely stressed out and shaking. Um, so please forgive me if it's gonna be a little bit of a, uh, there will be some moments when I will be hesitating with some words. I'm just overwhelmed. Did I ask you to imagine that on this beautiful day, you are in the beautiful city of Prague? Because this is where we were supposed to be today. The meeting should have happened in, 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 uh, in the capital of Czech Republic. We were supposed to be meeting in person. Sadly, due to circumstances, uh, we have to use technology. But hey, uh, isn't it amazing that despite all the challenges, we can still meet and interact? I wanted to say quickly thank you to... Um, oops. Just one second, too quickly. I wanted to quickly say thank you to uh, Diagnosa FH and the uh, Czech Society for Atherosclerosis who were supposed to be our hosts today. Uh, thank you, Christina, and thank you to the whole team uh, in Czech Republic. I also wanted to recognize some people who unfortunately cannot join us today and they, they excuse themselves. They're actually uh, working on the ground, uh, supporting the COVID patients. So we have Branjo from Slovakia and we have Olivier from Brussels, from Belgium. Uh, I, I'm, I'm fearing that uh, Meryl, who is from Turkey and also accepted the meeting, she won't be joining potentially because as you know, she's based in uh, Turkey, Izmir, and there was an earthquake there. But I just wanted to say hello to those people who cannot join us in person. Um, the people who make this meeting happen today and they're invisible uh, to you is Miguel, Asha, our technical, uh, technical magicians, and Sandra, Carmelo, uh, Florence and Laura, who are making it possible for the Italian and the French uh, uh, friends to join us and doing the simultaneous translations. Thank you so much. With that, I will go to the uh, 2019 and 2020 updates. Uh, it's going to be a last last 12 months overview. If for those who were here, well, here, those who joined the meeting last year in person in Bucharest, you might recall it was my first day with the organization. So it's been quite an intense 12 months, not to throw into the mix uh, uh, COVID to, to, to shake things up and make it a little bit more exciting for a new starter. But before that, I would like to look back at our uh, report from the meeting. Where is it that we left off, really? If you recall, uh, this is a picture from um, Bucharest. We were 29 participants at the time. Um, and at the end of the day, we had a workshop, an interactive uh, session where we jotted down the benefits of being part of FH Europe, as well your expectations uh, towards FH Europe and some of the wishes. And I just wonder if uh, at the end of this presentation, you will be able to say, have we fulfilled those wishes? Uh, one of the most exciting one was make FH Europe global. Uh, let's see how that panned out. Uh, you also asked for other things, more uh, interactions between the team, uh, more interaction on social media, uh, bringing our voice to the European level and so on and so forth. I will not necessarily read all of that, but I'll just ask you to keep a, a, a visual memory of this particular slide when we go through the activities of the past 12 months. 
So indeed, uh, my personal journey with FH Europe started on November 1st, and right, uh, right, uh, uh, right after the annual meeting, we had the launch of the Global Call to Action, uh, January 2nd, an extremely successful uh, project where a lot of you have contributed. Right after January, end of, uh, end of January, we had our uh, strategy meeting in Zurich with some of the leaders of the patient uh, organizations in the local countries where we could together discuss the strategy for the organization moving forward. Um, I think we will be building a lot on that specific uh, meeting and the outcomes of the meeting. Simultaneously, I also started uh, travel around Europe as long as it was possible to meet as many as you. It was extremely important to me to, to ensure that we get to know each other as people, but also to get to know your challenges, problems, but also some wonderful um, ideas and solutions uh, that you have in your countries. Here only a, a few uh, screenshots of interactions that happened. End of February, uh, February 29th, we had the Rare Disease Day. And I would like to say, everyone, thank you for contributing because it was first campaign that we did together uh, on a daily basis, uh, sharing content and raising awareness around HOFH and FCS. Uh, for me personally, that was an extremely important initiative because it was the first time I really worked with many of you uh, in, in real time. Um, one other thing, because I just looked at the picture of Anna Andrea, uh, 29th of February, I was exactly in Vienna, uh, together with the Austrian and German uh, friends and representatives, also uh, remembering one of the founders of uh, FH Europe, Gabi. We did a, mem a memory walk uh, uh, on the outskirts, in the outskirts of Vienna together. And unfortunately, uh, this is the moment where the unforeseen started, uh, the pandemic hit Europe, starting from Italy. Um, it was quite a challenging phase to understand what's going on in the countries, how everyone is being impacted. We knew so little about the implications on, on our patient groups, on the organizations and the ind individuals in the countries. And if you remember, we started uh, when the lockdowns uh, kicked in uh, across Europe, first in Italy and then Spain and other countries. And, and we circulated an image to show support for one another. After that, we kicked off uh, the virtual connect. We for the first time started doing Zoom calls. That was basically the time when Average Europe uh, acquired a Zoom account, just for those virtual connect calls to, to show support, to gather insights and understand what is really happening uh, in every single country across Europe. Uh, after those calls, after the first call, we published the good practices from across Europe for FH patient organizations in the COVID crisis. Again, another example of collaborative uh, project where each of you contributed as much as you can, could with suggestions, ideas, how to support patient organizations and patients with FH um, in your countries. And I, and I dare say that was one of the first, even if not perfect, one of the first such uh, uh, tools that patient organizations put together at the beginning of the pandemic. And the next thing, the next success uh, uh, was our uh, joint publication. The next thing that we realized um, as a result of those calls that the unforeseen outcomes, uh, results of the lockdowns and the stay home message, which really uh, turned out to be catastrophic for the patient community, especially those who are facing uh, CVD, uh, those who might be uh, struggling with cardiac events uh, when in lockdown, when encouraged to stay home. And so if you remember, together with the Global Heart Hub, uh, FH Europe partner on a campaign, in a campaign, uh, when your heart says so, just go. It was a very, very successful campaign, uh, 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 unexpectedly, probably. Uh, as you can see in the slide, it reached so many people across the world. Uh, it was translated in, into many languages. Uh, and so it was featured in many, um, 
TV, radio stations, as well as publications after the campaign uh, uh, end of the summer to demonstrate how patient we're supporting patients in those very difficult um, times. So I just wanted to say on behalf of Average Europe and Global Heart Hub, thank you for your engagement in that campaign. That was very, um, very reactive and very um, ad hoc and definitely not planned. The next thing that really happened was the FH Awareness Day in September. Uh, and again, a, a fabulous example of collaboration amongst the network, but also uh, with external stakeholders. And I'm uh, absolutely delighted to, to say that we, as an organization, managed to engage so many external stakeholders, um, societies, uh, policymakers, uh, and other patient organizations. So um, as they say in English, kudos to us, kudos to you, and um, what a wonderful uh, example that we can pull off uh, quite an impressive campaign. And why do I say it was impressive? Because, oh, just one second, something happened. Not the right time when you're trying to uh, impress everyone. I will, I will skip that bit. Why was it impressive? Because we managed to reach so many people across Europe and world with our messages. And again, I wanted to say thank you to, to everyone who contributed as much as they could in terms of uh, uh, spreading the word, raising, raising uh, awareness uh, and, and using uh, a little hashtag that connected all of us across the countries. Here are some uh, snapshots from uh, social media from different countries. So you can see Turkey, Slovenia, uh, Germany, Latvia, Ireland, and um, Czech Republic. But there were many, many more. On that occasion, uh, on the occasion of the FH um, Awareness Day, we also launched the Global Call to Action. Although it was published and available back in January, uh, we were really able to translate it and deliver it in uh, 21 languages uh, in a shorter version uh, uh, to you on that specific day. And uh, trying to uh, make it as usable for lay public. We developed some of the uh, interactive cards that you might have seen on, on social media. The lady behind that, who actually made it, created, was Asha that I introduced earlier. So thank you, Asha. What is quite, uh, as I said earlier, impressive is the outreach. How many people we managed to uh, get to uh, through social media is incredible. And I have shared those statistics with you through the uh, post-campaign report. So I'm not going to uh, uh, repeat that. There is only one learning here. And the learning is that in those very difficult times when social interactions are very limited, we are absolutely encouraged, forced, and smart if we use social media channels. And that's definitely the way forward. And I would absolutely encourage us as a network to leverage that. Um, here are a few more examples of external uh, engagement on that occasion. Uh, new organizations that uh, helped us spread the word. So the European Heart Network, uh, the European Association for Preventative uh, Cardiology, uh, Global Heart Hub, the um, Alliance for Patient Access, EAS, the European Atherosclerosis Society, proudly displayed engagement and partnership with us in, in different, um, in those uh, uh, um, activities. Even colleagues from Iraq uh, and an Iraqi patient organization were uh, highlighting the FH Aware 2020 hashtag and sharing the messages. So something to be really, really proud of. Apart from that, the industry partners were happy to uh, spread the word. So FPIA, the European um, Pharmaceutical Industry Association, uh, offered us a slot to have a a guest blog. Uh, Amrit was having actually a special banner on the occasion on their website. Uh, Amgen re -allow allowed us to reuse beautiful movie uh, uh, from Heart, where we can see a lot of you uh, uh, um, 
providing your personal stories and advocating for FH community. And finally, we also had a, a, an article in the New Scientist. And some of you came forward and offered to be social media ambassadors. So big thank you to Amaro and Bianca, who are part of our network for uh, tweeting uh, 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 all the time, tirelessly on, on, on Twitter, the messages around FH. And also another uh, French influencer, uh, uh, um, a president of the scientific uh, committee from the uh, cardio uh, uh, Cardiovascular Prevention Institute came forward and suggested that he would be absolutely delighted to be our um, ambassador. The last element uh, that was extremely successful and I would like to dedicate a little bit of time to, to walk you through is, is another pilot initiative that we did, not quite sure what the outcomes would be, but they actually surpassed our expectations, was the uh, collaboration with MedEasy it's a startup, it's an online global community of young physicians and medical students. Together with that uh, global community online and EAS, we launched um, <clears throat> uh, an online um, survey quiz to educate them around FH. The numbers were extraordinary. The quiz reached over 111,000 young physicians and medical students around the world. The campaign lasted for 10 days on those social uh, channels and actually over 24,000 participants took, uh, took part in that quiz. Those numbers when I uh, presented them at the Global FH Task Force were welcomed with such enthusiasm that as a result, uh, the president of EAS offered to publish it. So, um, with, with, with a group of people at FH uh, team, and they will be presented in a short second, uh, we were absolutely delighted to put together a publication that should be soon available in atherosclerosis. So once again, absolutely delighted and so happy that maybe those unusual channels that we are leveraging now uh, are helping us uh, reach one of the stakeholders, the medical community. And after, after the FH uh, Awareness Day, uh, I had a chance to... Uh, journée, uh, internationale oh, something proche. happened here and I can suddenly hear the interpreters. Um, is that... I think it's fixed now. Um, after that, I had a... a, a cette oh, nope. I don't know if you guys ah. can as well hear uh, the French translation. Yeah, something is... Uh, let's try and see what's happening there. I will be looking at Miguel and Asha. Uh, I hope, guys, you are on the case. We're just looking into it, Magda. Okay, thank you. So maybe I will pause for one second and allow myself a sip of water. Otherwise, I will be... I'm so nervous. When I speak very calmly, it's because I'm ultra nervous. <laughs> um Florence, can you, you are on mute. So that probably, is, does that mean that it's fixed? Yeah, so we've Wonderful. muted Florence. I think she just had unmuted herself in this bit. So I think we're good. Okay, super. Wonderful, thank you so much. So um, at the same, around the same time, I had a privilege to represent our network and all our patient organizations at EAS, at the uh, FHSC steering group, so the global FH registry meeting. And I have pulled out one slide that I presented at that meeting, demonstrating the difference between, um, um, not the difference maybe, but uh, sort of a mapping of uh, where FH Europe is already present with patient organizations and where there are existing FH registries. Uh, that's in green. In red, you can see countries where there is no patient organization that's collaborating with uh, FH Europe, but there is a registry. So uh, we should be absolutely uh, getting involved and trying to help if, if, if needed, set up patient organizations. In the meantime, since, since that presentation, I can tell you that actually Slovenia and uh, Slovenia is now uh, a member of FH Europe and Ukraine actually has got a patient organization um, and then in yellow, I have marked countries that have a certain relation to FH Europe, but it's 
semi loose and maybe we need to make it up and 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 right after that presentation uh slovakia you can see here is in yellow for the first time i had a wonderful call and a great uh discussion with Branio from uh, from slovakia so that should now be absolutely green and finally one country surprisingly and we have alexander now on the call um is sweden there is a patient organization but actually there is no registry that is uh at least not involved with the global fh registry and in between uh those uh, opportunities to 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 raise our voice and and raise awareness uh, there was also the world heart day on september 29 uh, by the world heart Pro uh, world heart World Heart Federation, and we were leveraging that opportunity and their toolkits to, to raise awareness around our conditions. And a day later, uh, we had an opportunity to advocate together with uh, one of uh, our patient ambassadors around LPLA. So um, um, we were having a Twitter chat, a live Twitter chat. And only uh, last week, uh, FH Europe, and that was as a, a bit of a surprise, so uh, I haven't necessarily involved you as a network. There was um, uh, um, the FCS uh, Awareness Day yesterday, so over the past days throughout the week, we were posting information around the condition and um, how, how to live with that and sharing some testimonials of patients. So now I will pause and ask quickly, Miguel, how are we doing time-wise? Because I'm feeling that we are, I'm overrunning a little bit. Just a little bit. All right, then. Thank you. This is such a diplomatic answer. <laughs> so I will swiftly move to the next part of this presentation. I am, um, I am really, really pleased, really, really happy that um, FH Europe was able to build on uh, previous uh, successes of Jules and, and other trustees in building new partnerships and memberships. And since since uh, January this year, um, that was the basically the in, in, back in January we had uh, an opportunity together with Jules to meet with uh, leadership of EAS FHSC in London with Professor Koshre and his group to reiterate our willingness and, and keenness to collaborate with the, with the global registry. Since then, we also signed a partnership agreement with Screen Pro FH. It's an organization in uh, Central, Eastern and Southern Europe. And we have guest uh, speakers today, uh, Lucy and Tatiana, who will tell more about this organization and how can that enhance our efforts. We've been collaborating with the Global Heart Hub. We became uh, a member uh, of World Heart Federation and also a member of Eurotis, for those who might not be aware of uh, Eurotis. It's the rare disease. Uh, uh, um, now, pan, pan, it's actually global, not beyond the European patient organization. Also, uh, we've been invited to join FPA patient think tank. And uh, we have guest speaker, Sofia, who will be explaining more what are the benefits to us uh, in, in efforts to collaborate with the industry uh, around FH and other conditions. And then we have also uh, managed to collaborate successfully with the International Therosclerosis Society, the European Society of Cardiology, uh, GAFPA, the Global Alliance for Patient Access, have been very keenly supporting us in our uh, um, campaign, spreading the word beyond Europe. ELEP, uh, uh, another organization, the uh, International Lipid Expert Panel, supporting us with the uh, publication around COVID. And finally, I dare say, saying uh, that we've been collaborating with the European Patients Forum, although we are not yet officially the member uh, for, for, the, for many different um, reasons, but um, uh, this is a, a very influential uh, patient organization based in ba uh, Brussels that helps um, organizations like ours uh, bring our voice uh, 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 and, and, and collaborate, uh, uh, maybe uh, get attention of, of the European Council, uh, the European Commission, uh, on all the uh, European bodies in, uh, in Europe, uh, in the European Union. Uh, the, the reason why, why, why I put that logo there is because I had a 
uh, privilege uh, uh, to get accepted into um, leadership uh, and governance training that uh, lasted six months. So we're still benefiting from that organization quite a lot. Bear with me. Uh, okay, just one second. Um, you might already know that the Jules has previously built a, a good working collaboration with the World Heart Federation. I had only opportunity to leverage what has been done. And as we became officially a member of the World Heart Federation, it was almost natural that then we uh, got invited to become a representative as an organization on the Global FH uh, Advocacy Group. And that's extremely beneficial to our organization because we can contribute to a lot of global and international initiatives, but also we can uh, benefit from that powerful uh, platform and use World Heart Federation in our efforts. And one of the examples that hopefully we will be using that is uh, in France. So I will be looking at Bernard and Veronique uh, in the efforts to uh, advocate for uh, early child screening over there. Uh, let's, let's hope it's going to work. Also, as part of that uh, collaboration with the World uh, Heart Federation, uh, FH Europe has partnered uh, with the organization on a global advocacy mapping survey. A lot of you probably got invitations to contribute to that survey. Um, just so that you know, um, we've reached out to 102 countries around the globe. And today, literally till yesterday, 69 countries responded. And um, as a result of that, survey we will produce a report on state of things in terms of advocacy for FH and uh, there will be as well publication so all of you who have contributed thank you so much uh, I will be reaching out uh, to you very shortly for those of you who haven't answered yet and there are some people on this virtual meeting today who still haven't think about it as an opportunity for your country to, to, to represent the situation there. I'm not gonna say France and Italy. Oops, I just did. Um, guys, it's a wonderful opportunity for you. Um, the global call to action, I mentioned it earlier. Um, I'm again, very thrilled to share that FH Europe led those um, efforts to get the document translated. Um, if you remember the publication was made available in January and uh, it was our organization that really made sure that it's translated into 21 languages and made available. You have uh, contributed greatly by reviewing the translation so thank you so much. The initiative, the, the, the idea as well um, in the document that's available on our website uh, to download in a Word document was to make this document non-branded in word format so you can use it you can make it yours the way you need it add your references add your logos and leverage that global effort for um, your policy and advocacy efforts in your countries i'm getting i'm getting almost to the end of my presentation uh, one other thing, uh, another opportunity that has been created as part of those partnerships with other organizations and here specifically with uh, with Eurordis is um, our uh, application to join at, uh, the Brussels where uh, the Brussels Rare Disease Week has been accepted. So FH Europe will be able to uh, advocate together with the uh, policymakers in Brussels around uh, uh, rare disease we, 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 the, the community we advocate for. So I, I plead to you and I take this opportunity to say, if you would like to use this channel and um, suggest that I meet with maybe your MPs, your uh, uh, members of parliament per country, those activities can be granted. Those activities could possibly happen. So I, I do wholeheartedly invite you, if you're interested, please reach out after, after this meeting and, and suggest uh, how we can make that the possibility for you specifically in, in every country uh, across Europe. So as I, um, I was just saying now, um, all sounds great, all sounds fabulous. Um, I guess it does. Actually, I was supposed to now uh, do the gallery screen and say, hey, what do you think? Thumbs up. 
but I just I just spilled the joke here by going to the next uh, to the next slide by what's in it for me? What's in it for you? Um, so far, what has FH Europe done this year for you to 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 um, to say that you want to be part of this organization? There is there is um, there is. Um, benefit. I think there are some very basic, basic examples. We produced together, so uh, all of you were, were able to contribute and, and uh, uh, get visibility as patient organizations, as representatives of patient organizations for FH at the, together with the COVID publication uh, through the FH Awareness Day. Also, FH Europe now, thanks to its visibility and um, this central hub uh, position, is getting more requests from uh, different organizations um, to um, provide testimonials to provide contribution and uh, and so as a, as a central organization we were able to invite uh, some of you to uh, speaking opportunities with IT Sankyo it was a, it's a pharmaceutical company as you know and some of you uh, uh, leveraged that opportunity to speak that was also a, an, an opportunity for you to to get some funding for the organizations some of you are already working with Novartis on patient testimonials um, others were invited to uh, raise awareness around LB lay with silence therapeutic campaign uh, as we speak today, one of the patient ambassadors is participating in a health hack, raising awareness around uh, LPLA. Um, many of you also contributed to the World Heart Federation cholesterol white paper, which will be published probably at, uh, at the end of the year, beginning of 2021. So in the future, I would like to believe that if we all contribute, share and speak up and leverage those little and big opportunities, we can get a stronger one voice, we will get visibility. As individual patient organizations, you will be able to raise um, awareness, get more educated, but also get more empowered. I do believe that through our collaboration, we will get more funding as a, as a network, and we will also secure access to some critical decision, make, uh, decision makers. And examples, as I mentioned earlier, is the Brussels week. Um, part of the um, membership with the Eurotis organization is that we can access rare disease patient schools, which are absolutely phenomenal educational activities, different activities and awareness campaigns. But I think we will talk about it a lot more in our afternoon session when we talk about uh, projects for 2021. And now we'll quickly do temperature check and have a gallery view so I can see your faces. And now we will do this exercise. Uh, how is it going? Are you still there? Thumbs up. Remember, there's only one option, only thumbs up. Bernard, feel no pressure. <laughs> Thank you so much. OK, I think um, very important updates because there is a lot of new people joining this call today. And some of you might wonder why it's important to to um, to understand FH Europe organizational structure, the long term sustainability and development. Um, as you remember, hopefully you do remember, back in March and April, we reached out to you through emails and through social media and also on our website, uh, advertising for opportunities to become uh, uh, a trustee with FH Europe. And um, there were some there was some feedback. Unfortunately, there hasn't necessarily been enough interest from the network to, to bring more of the network representatives to join the board. And what I realized over the time speaking to you afterwards with some of you, uh, many of you still didn't necessarily um, understand what the implications of being a trustee, uh, what the implications are. And I think for many of you, having seen uh, Jules and Gunnar and Ines uh, and other people uh, uh, who were on the board before, it might have looked like a lot of work because those people were so actively um, involved traveling and working very, very hard. And I guess many of you were too scared maybe that on top of your 
daily work and private life, you would be getting yourself into yet another full time job with Epic Europe. So I do I do appreciate it. And I think it's going to be our uh, job to communicate better and make sure that there is an understanding and appreciation of the potential that being a trustee brings to you and your organizations and the whole community. So after the ad, um, recruitment process, um, we have identified some uh, phenomenal people from around the world, and it is from around the world, beyond Europe. So uh, in line with our constitution that allows nine trustees on the board, and at that time we had Jules, who was uh, the chair and still is, Gunnar, uh, John and Inessa, we identified uh, five more people um, so you can see here uh, in the pictures, and you should be able to see my uh, cursor, uh, Marius, Joe, Sam, Dorota, and Giovanni. Those are our new trustees that joined the organization as of um, April. And they will have a chance in a second to present themselves. Before that, I just wanted to say that Inessa, due to her uh, personal commitments and um, ambitions to, uh, to, to deepen her expertise and knowledge, she uh, decided to uh, take a, a, a university program and unfortunately uh, had to step down from the role. Nevertheless, th that her time with FH Europe was coming to an end uh, in January, so it was just a, a matter of time. Also, Gunnar, uh, after uh, working for, for, I think, Jules, correct me if I'm wrong four or five years now tirelessly for the organization is really really keen to 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 step down and uh, as Jules always says pick up golf again and uh, finally um, Jules uh, also as you as you probably remember as of last year already when I was appointed was very very uh, vocal about saying that she needs to step down so she can make sure that uh, uh, the child screening in the UK is happening, so she wants to dedicate more time and effort to that. So uh, Jules uh, 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 offered to stay a little bit longer until end of the year, but she will be stepping down at the end of the year. So that means oh, that we have uh, six uh, people on the board. And that also means that there will be three new opportunities to become a uh, trustee. And with that, I will pass on to John. John is not a new trustee, but he will be the only one carrying over the torch. So um, I'll stop here and over to you, John. Good morning, everybody. Um, I, I feel a little bit like an endangered species being the only, the only one in the top row still standing, but um, I've been the treasurer now for about 18 months. Um, I'm from the UK. And my background is in management consulting. I was a partner with Deloitte for 20, 25 years. And as part of that, I had a, a number of global and international roles, including the, um, the technology consulting lead for Europe, Europe, Middle East and Africa. So I'm, I'm quite used to working around Europe. And that's one of the reasons why I think um, Jules thought it would be useful for me to, to have a go at this role. I've known Jules for, for some years as a, as a mentor through my, um, my charitable work through the um, delivery company of management consultants and um, got to admire very much the work that she's done in the UK. And um, as that was coming to an end, she felt that it would be good for me to um, use some of my expertise in FH Europe. I think, you know, to me, the, the vision is the most important thing is, you know, FH Europe as the voice of FH in Europe and obviously related conditions too. I think being seen as the, the leader for policy and advocacy in FH is, is where we need to be. Um, I have a reasonable grasp of languages. I mean, when I have a little bit of practice, my French is quite good. I can read some German, Italian, Spanish, and so on, a little bit of Russian, um, Latin, and, and a bit of Greek. But, okay, um, that's not, nobody can beat that. No, but it's not, it's not great. I mean, I, I did Latin and Greek and French at school, but um, the rest I've picked up as I've gone along. But I'm, I think I'm quite good at languages, but I never get any practice because as an English person, everyone wants to speak English. People, you heard that? Anyone who wants to practice French with John, that's your opportunity. <laughs> Je good. 
Non <laughs> Continue on. <laughs> okay. And my personal thing is I'm, I'm an amateur musician. I love it. I'm a trustee of a period instrument orchestra, the kind of ancient music. And that's, um, that's the other great thing in my life, apart from my family. Wonderful. Thank you so much, John. And thank you for being such a great uh, supporter uh, on an almost daily basis. So um, thank you. Over to uh, Joe or Joanne Taylor. Hello, everybody. It's nice to meet you. Yeah, I'm Joanna Taylor, but most people don't call me Joe unless I am uh, uh, in trouble for something. So hopefully I won't be. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I'm uh, British, um, but I've made my way to Switzerland through seven different countries over, um, over the course of my life. Um, and now I've been in Switzerland for the past 10 years. Um, I'm a uh, current partner at another management consulting firm. Um, so still, still a long way to go before I retire, John, but, uh, but uh, yeah, certainly active now and focusing very much on the health sciences and wellness industry. So uh, I actually work on the intersect of business and IT and, and how companies can sort of use new, new tech to address business challenges and, and support their digital transformation and add value to uh, patients and, uh, and um, the organizations. So um, I also am a, I have a PhD in um, global e-health. So uh, I'm a published researcher on the use of social media by patients with non-communicable diseases. Um, and I also lecture at a university on topics such as business of e-health and business health informatics. Um, amongst other things. So I, I, jo I joined um, FH Europe, as Magda said, in April. Very excited to do so. Um, it's the first time I've been a trustee, um, but really looking to bring, bring um, together my sort of business experience in academia to sort of um, um, create an impact around this, these sorts of conditions for individuals in society. And uh, my vision is really about trying to increase awareness, diagnosis and treatment of, of these sorts of conditions and, and how we can influence that um, across the, the network and also within the ecosystem of, of uh, different uh, stakeholders that are involved in, 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 this, um, in these conditions. I am, I am, I speak English, although a bit like John, I kind of, I've dabbled in different, uh, <laughs> in different languages over the years, but I wouldn't claim them to be um, uh, proficient at all, but I have done Arabic, I have done uh, Spanish, German, Dutch, um, Thai, um, lots of different, yeah, <laughs> lots of different languages. I can count to 10 in many, but not very uh, proficient in any of them. So uh, I have something, I guess, a bit personal to me. I've got two young children and, uh, um, I, I know the trustees, whenever we have a meetings and my colleagues at work often get to experience them on a regular basis as they participate in our, uh, in our um, discussions and Zoom calls. So they may make an appearance today, but it's, uh, it's very nice to meet you all. I'm very much looking forward to the discussion later. Thank you so much, Joe. And by the way, uh, I ask everyone not to show off. And now I am discovering that we have Joe who speaks Arabic. Amazing. No, no, no. I, don't, I wouldn't classify it as speaking. It's more <laughs> phrases and certain things. I can get by. <laughs> Wonderful. Now over to Sam. And as you know, um, no, sorry, you might not know. Um, so we have uh, Sam Gidding who joined our organization. He is the senior co-author of the Global Call to Action. It's an absolute privilege to have uh, such a wonderful board and among uh, the board members, uh, 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 an expert in the in the disease. Uh, Sam is based in the US uh, and he was uh, 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 not able to join at this very early hour. He left us a personal message over video. So I just hope it's gonna play now. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Sam Gidding and I'm a trustee of FH Europe. And as a trustee, I also co-chair the Scientific and Health Policy Advisory Group. I live in the USA, particularly in Vermont, which has the lowest COVID-19 rate in the United States. Uh, I started my career as a preventive pediatric cardiologist and epidemiologist close to 40 years ago and have been interested in FH uh, for the past three and a half decades. Um, after I retired from clinical practice, 
I had a career in FH advocacy, being the chief medical officer of the FH Foundation for one and a half years. Uh, over time, I've, offered well, I've authored well over 50 publications on FH, including key scientific statements and guidelines, and played a leading role in developing the Global Call to Action on FH, which was published in JAMA Cardiology uh, last January. I joined FH Europe because some of the most exciting work on FH is going on in Europe, and it's a great opportunity to raise FH awareness and improve FH diagnosis. Also, it is extremely important to support the FH patient voice in managing their own care because FH is a familial condition. Families really need to be in control of their care and make a lot of important choices uh, working in partnership with the medical team. My vision for the network is to create a community that diagnoses 100% of the people with FH in Europe. I speak American English. Uh, and no foreign language, so I'm a typical American. Uh, and I'm also happy to talk about jazz wine and Tottenham Hotspur at any time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sam. And if there are any football fans, please do take that opportunity and talk about Hotspurs uh, with uh, Tottenham Hotspurs with, with uh, Sam. He will be over the moon. What a privilege to have him uh, among our trustees. And now over to Dorota. Okay, so uh, hello everybody. I am extremely excited to be here and to meet all of you at least in such a way. So my name is Dorota Zgutka and Magda, thank you for introduction already myself also as a new trustee. Uh, so what I can tell about myself is uh, since uh, 12 years I am living in Switzerland. Uh, before I was uh, living in Poland and US, and I am from Poland. Uh, I am very excited to join uh, FH Europe because I really believe that uh, we can do a lot of together for the best of patients. Um, I am speaking English, talking about my uh, English and Polish, uh, talking also about my uh, background. Uh, I have to tell that I have got uh, like 20 years of experience uh, in life science, including industry, um, consulting, uh, strategic and management consulting and also academia. So, uh, and in academia I was working in science, so I'm also author of many scientific publications. Uh, currently, I am very much excited to work on various patient journey to, to, to help identify opportunity map for the best of patients. And in particular, I would like highly to contribute to uh, FH Europe and really to allow us to build spirit of the one community who trust each other, who is really representing us uh, externally and openly discussing internally as a one voice for the best of the FH Europe uh, patients and uh, for, for FH patients and uh, people impacted by this disease. Uh, personally, what I can tell, I am a huge lover of dogs, in particular uh, one, <laughs> which is my own, but not only. Thank you, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to uh, join our uh, sessions where, where, where would be opportunity to know each other more. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dorota. And uh, thank you, Giovanni, for letting me know that I was overzealous to see everyone in a gallery view and stop the presentation. So, But Dorota has absolutely nailed it in terms of sharing her profile. Next, um, either making a joke is um, Marius. He's the only one who has not sent me his profile, so I filled it up for him. But he's excused because he is an extremely, no, very important person. He is our very own celebrity. And he will explain in a second why, I'm sure. Over to you, Marius. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Magda, for, for the introduction. Um, indeed, this year I'm highly involved in, uh, uh, in Romania in the COVID story. Uh, and my colleague, colleagues just told me that uh, I give more than 200 interviews this year for television and radio stations and uh, websites and newspapers and, and so on. 
and I'm doing this because I, I uh, try somehow to, to set the, uh, the agenda around, around science and uh, uh, the right expectations when it comes to the management of the, of the COVID with the testing and vaccines and drugs and, uh, and uh, so on. Uh, my role uh, uh, at the FH Europe is uh, as a trustee and the co-chair of the Scientific and Health Policy Advisory Group. I'm from Bucharest, from Romania. My background is medical doctor. Um, 15 years ago, actually, I became um, also an entrepreneur uh, in the field of health communication. I uh, manage, uh, actually, I build at least three um, media brands uh, here in, in Romania. In 2014, I founded the Center for Innovation in, in Medicine, a not for profit organization. We, uh, we are focused on uh, different types of, uh, of innovation from medicine and diagnostics to data and uh, health system transformation. We, uh, we are building a lot of uh, multi-stakeholders platform around this type of, uh, of innovation. We started in, in Romania to work with the uh, Romanian president five years ago to build a national conference on personalized medicine. We have built also with the parliament a strong relationship having uh, annual meetings, science meets politician and, and so on. And I'm very happy to, to join the FH Europe uh, uh, because I'm, my main interest actually is in, on personalized medicine and I see a lot of opportunities uh, to, uh, to uh, first to, to start talking about this in, this, in the field of, of cardiology, mainly uh, in, in card cardiovascular diseases prevention. And I see FH as a potential demonstrator for what uh, should mean personalized prevention of cardiovascular diseases. I speak Romanian, English, a little bit of French, I understand some words in, in German. Uh, I can read Italian and Spanish. I can also understand some Russian words. Uh, and something very personal for me, yes, uh, I'm in this context. I, uh, I'm a figure on, on, on the media, but I may say that uh, actually the uh, highest uh, audience that I reached was uh, about 10 years ago, being a sport journalist, uh, actually a football journalist. And uh, at that time, I work for uh, for uh, for a sport journal, and uh, I was currently invited to television to discuss around uh, different uh, football matches and and uh, so on. Thank you so much. I love those meetings because there is always something new that <laughs> I learn about our new trustees, and I hope uh, it's been interesting for for the rest of the people around the around Europe, around our virtual table. Last but not least, it's my great pleasure to um, introduce um, Giovanni, and I'm sure that the Italian and French speaking community will be absolutely thrilled. Giovanni, over to you. Hello, can you can you hear me first of all? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Just to go back to Miguel's point, uh, I'm not muted. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here to meet all of you. So my name is uh, Giovanni Nizato. I'm a trustee of FH Europe, one of the one of the new ones. I am originally from Italy. That's where I was uh, born, and I'm currently living in Switzerland. In the meantime, I I moved a bit, and uh, um, I'm writing down the countries that I've been living in for a significant number of years. Uh, I'm actually a citizen of two continents. Uh, I'm also a citizen of the US. So I tend to look at the world as uh, one place and uh, with uh, close to 8 billion people living in it. If it's Europe is an organization that spans uh, close to 900 million people. And as, as Magda was showing to you, it's already networked with many others. So um, I tend to look at um, the place where we live in as, as one and it's earth. As a background, so um, I have a PhD in physics. That was a long time ago. And uh, in the meantime, I worked 
as a technologist, research scientist, project manager, and innovation manager in different functions in different companies. I'm currently building my own company, so you can qualify that as entrepreneurship. And uh, one of the things that I'm very passionate about is uh, connecting the use of uh, technologies to solutions that help people. And in the middle of this, uh, citizens, patients are very important to me. One of the projects that uh, I'm working on actually, Magda mentioned already, and I will share the link later on because uh, it concerns really an online effort to start imagining and prototyping digital solutions around patients. So it's one of the first truly patient-centric hackathons that I could, I could see. Why I joined FA Europe? Well, first of all, Magda was uh, uh, very convincing in, in uh, in talking about the organization. And uh, actually, I would say I was shocked into action. I was shocked to realize what FH and other dyslipidemias were, how prevalent they were, and the amount of work that needs to be done to create more awareness and more action. So I basically joined uh, to learn and to serve from the citizen patient perspective to see what does it look like and see where I can, what I can do to help. The way I see FH Europe, it's FH Europe, in my view, is a network of networks. And I'm looking forward to helping and supporting the board to increase its effectiveness, its capabilities, and leveraging those. So the, the problem is relatively simple. We have a lot of people that are affected, either directly or their families. A lot of these people don't know. And the solution to this, however, is very complex and we're all part of this solution. I speak Italian, French, English, German. These are places I lived in. So I, in some cases, I understand also where somebody is from in terms of region in those countries. I've had exposure to other languages. Uh, language is a bit more than speaking. It's also how people think, it's a culture. And uh, depending on the day, I wear different cultures. And uh, something personal about me, uh, I sing. I'm, a, I'm so this is an amateur, <laughs> amateur thing to be clear. But I sing in an uh, a cappella choir here in uh, in Basel. I live in Basel, Switzerland, and um, it's something that brings me uh, a lot of uh, uh, joy. And uh, it's a bit difficult to do it nowadays with COVID, but um, yeah. Looking forward to talking with you. My job today is to be here and listen. Wonderful. And thank you so much, Giovanni. And I just wanted to say, Giovanni, thank you for being here, knowing that there is the international online hackathon running in the other virtual world right now, but you are here with us. And can I just say virtual, um, if you can, if you can virtually raise your hands up and say hello and welcome to our board of trustees. I think we have fabulous people here or thumbs up. You know, we're still learning how to interact with everyone virtually. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Um, and it's a, my great pleasure to hand over to one and only, uh, the only woman who could wear two hats, three hats, uh, chair of FH Europe, former chief executive of FH Europe, and also uh, uh, chief executive of Heart UK. Over to you, Jules. Thank you. Wow, what an introduction. So um, good morning, everybody. I'm absolutely delighted to uh, see everybody again. It's just so lovely. Uh, and even though we're in the virtual world, it's still nice to get together as a network. So, and uh, that's not my first slide, Magda. Sorry. No. Back. Is it the one with the uh, change of chair? Yes. Yes, that's the one. Thank you. So, Sorry. Um, I, I'm, I'm afraid, and this is so bad, guys. This is so bad. It's not there. It's this fine. is the next one. So can I just stop sharing and maybe just uh, yeah. okay. imagine? That's fine. I'll, I, I think I'll just take this opportunity to say how proud do I feel 
to be the chair of FH Europe because you look at what has been achieved just in the last year, it's absolutely amazing. And I might also point out that Magda is part-time and she only works three days a week. So when you look at the amount of achievement uh, that we've had over the last year, it's just incredible, absolutely incredible. So, um, so well done, Magda. I think it's absolutely brilliant. And I'm sure the network would uh, like to join me in giving you the thumbs up um, to say a massive thank you for everything you've done and, and truly put us on the international platform. So, so I wanted to talk to you about where, where we came from, actually, because um, the amazing network that we are currently, um, it wasn't always like that, of course. Nope. Just one second. This is what happens when you try and put someone else's slides into the deck. Apologies. Ah, that's okay. That's okay. Thank you. Thanks, Magda. So, um, so yes. So, as I say, from humble beginnings, the the picture on the left of the five people. That's that's Margarita from Norway, Gabby, as we all know from Austria, myself, Solange from Portugal, and Guna from Sweden. We were meeting for many years, um, just sharing information, becoming friends over the time and trying to think, you know, where do we move forward from here? And in 2015, we thought, actually, let's pull together an official network. So the, fruit, the future was looking absolutely brilliantly bright. We set on our way to do exactly that. And by December 2016, we officially registered the charity with the Charity Commission in the UK. And our first trustees was myself as chair for two years, Guna as treasurer for three years, Gabby for three years as a trustee, and Thanos from Greece for two years, and Isabel from Portugal for one year. And for personal circumstances, Thanos and Isabel stood down. And the picture in the middle is the board in 2018. Um, and so with Thanos and Isabel stepping down, Theodora from Switzerland and Inessa from Latvia joined the board. We weren't quite sure um, whether to take Theodora's little daughter in on the board, but we decided it was a little too early for her, but we featured her in the picture anyway. And then, of course, latterly, John joined the board as well. Now, I think... Obviously, Magda's gone through the, uh, the other, um, the new board as it looks now, but the time has definitely come for me to step down. I've now served four years. I was asked to stay on and really Heart UK needs my time. And as Magda said, child parent screening is a big slog in the UK. Um, we are getting there, but um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done around that and, and various other things as well to do with FH and other lipid conditions. But I wanted to just go back, what have we achieved together? And, and I'm hugely impressed at what Magda has gone through today. But I just want to look over the years, where have we got to? And when I was putting this together, I was thinking, actually, I'm hugely proud of what we did over that time. And of course, we started with actually setting the network up. That was the first thing to do. We started with about 18, 19 countries. Um, then we set up the official charity, and that was very important. We set up the website, and everybody that um, does that knows that's actually quite difficult and an awful lot of time. We developed a call to action back in 2015, and the picture on the um, far left is, uh, is the, some of the network actually at the European uh, Commission, actually Parliament, sorry, actually putting that call to action to Parliament and having conversations um, with MEPs and getting some movement. We had uh, conversations with the Commission continuing after that, and we were trying to get FH onto the platform that the European Commission has, and now Magda's taking that on to the next level. Um, clearly, the network contributed to the Global Call to Action that's already been uh, touched on, and this is a picture of um, the network in Dubai. Um, some of the network were also in the US 
contributing to the start of that global call to action. We've worked together to constantly raise awareness and we've, we've attended EAS every single year. Um, we developed an, an extremely good relationship with EAS and the EAS FHSC. And we've also attended other conferences and meetings to raise awareness of the network and our one voice about um, FH in Europe. And there's a, a good picture there of myself with Gabby and Mimo at the Mighty Medics conference in Rome. And of course, each year we've had our annual network meetings. And I think that I look forward to that. And I hope everybody else does. I so look forward to those. And I've looked forward to today and with just as much passion as I have done getting together physically. And I know we will do that in the future as well. But we've also shared information with impact. And it, that's been a, a really important part. And a good example of that is Sweden, uh, Guna talked about how there's a code in Sweden that is used to identify FH. And that now is used in Latvia. And, and that sounds like nothing, but it's such a huge step forward in Latvia that it's made a massive difference. And I'm sure Inessa can, can add to that because I know she's on the call. And there was many, many other opportunities to share information and learn and, and perhaps adopt things in our own countries that were working so well in other um, countries in the network. And then networking has just been amazing. It's not just about sitting there and listening. It's about talking to each other outside of those presentations and getting to know each other, but also sharing that information, just that little nugget of information that could make such a massive difference to another country. And of course, training. So the pictures in the middle are of three sets of training that we've done. We've carried out media training. We've carried out public affairs training, public affairs training, and also video training, which was an absolute screen, it must be said. And we've developed a lot of tools, training tools that are on the website and, and remain on there um, for everybody to access. And they're, they're great for new fledgling organizations that are looking to set up, which is something that we've always wanted to make sure that FH Europe supports. Um, because we know that there are countries, as Magda pointed out earlier, that don't have a patient organisation. And there should be a patient organisation in every European country. So that's part of what we set out to do. So, I mean, that's just a snapshot, an absolute snap snapshot on what we've actually achieved. Um, and I would like to recognise, even though Diana Maxwell is not here, many of you knew her, she was a huge impact in, in helping me to actually pull all this together and, and get all that work done. But we're in a new era. We've brought in a new chief executive to run the organisation. And in Magda, we have the right person to really push forward this organisation. And I think she's doing an absolutely great, great job. And the future definitely looks very bright for us. So I'm handing over to, to Giovanni because he's actually our chair-elect and I'm really proud to say that he's taking over from me on the 1st of January 2021. So Giovanni, would you like to say a few words, please? Thank you very much, Jules. So I've already said a few words uh, during the introduction round. Maybe what I can add now is that I look forward to the transition period because there's a lot uh, that has been going on. So I'm still on a steep learning curve. Just to be also very clear, you're not disappearing from the from the scene. <laughs> you're you're very much staying on as one of the yes. pillars of the FH community. And uh, maybe for the members here, uh, there's going to be a few weeks, couple of months time between now and January. So I will be in constant contact with both Jules and Magda to make sure that uh, there's a smooth transition. So there's no, nothing changes day to day. And uh, I'm also looking forward to working with uh, all the trustees in, in the board to, um, this is just to be very clear, uh, it's, a, it's a huge honor to be working with this team. So the way I see it is I wanna make sure that we can do as well as a team as possible. 
And we are a new team that's still forming, and it's going to take us a few weeks, months to, to be fully, uh, I wouldn't say operational, but fully effective. We are operational now, but there's a lot of potential, and I'm very much looking forward to that. So as I said earlier, it starts today by listening and, uh, and uh, in the future to communicate back with all of you that are here today, how we can be a better and stronger network together. Thank you, Giovanni. Thank you. And, and welcome, not just to the board, but as chair. And I'm sure the network um, will welcome you with open arms as they have done with me and be very supportive of you too. So good luck in the role as, as chair from next year. So I look forward to working with you in that uh, in the um, intervening period. Thank you. So Magda, can you move on one slide, please? So, um, so as Magda highlighted earlier, um, I think we need to be clear in, in terms of what is the difference between a, what a board of trustees do and what the chief exec does. And I think in the past, it's, it's become a little bit blurred because I kind of did both roles. Um, and so it's delightful to, to bring Magda in to have some proper um, dedicated focus as a chief executive. Um, so trustees, uh, it, it's, it's a very clear delineation um, between the two. So the trustees set the strategy with the chief executive, of course, they approve the operational plan and they approve the budget. The fundamental point about trustees is to make sure that we actually ensure that we are delivering our charitable objectives and we are spending the money in the correct way. So, um, so that's very, very important. Next slide, please, Magda. The responsibility of the chief exec is actually to deliver that operational plan to budget and of course, reporting to the trustees and foster a positive relationship with the trustees. That's really important. And the, and the exceptionally important relationship is actually between the chief executive and the chair. And I'm pleased to say that Magda and I have had a really good relationship since she's been on board. And you know we've, we've dealt with challenges together and we've had some great times and we've had some challenging times, but that's, that's all part and parcel of how things work. But it isn't just about the trustees and the board of trustees, the chair and the chief executive, it's about the network because the network are our beneficiaries and that is that, that kind of completes the loop as far as I'm concerned. So, uh, and I think that's a very important point. So our beneficiaries is why FH Europe exists. So thank you, Magda, could you? Thank you. In terms of the roles, and the split, I'm not gonna go through all of this. I believe that Magda is going to share the slides afterwards, hopefully. So um, the board of trustees just deal with the governance side. So it's, it's the vision, it's the strategy, it's the policies, it's the money, obviously. Um, and then the, they delegate the responsibility for the running of the organization on a day-to-day -day basis to the chief executive. And so you can look at your leisure um, when you receive the, the slides, um, exactly what those roles both entail. Uh, next slide, please. In fact, my last slide, please. Thank you. And, and sorry, yeah, one more, you can go on. That's it, thank you. Um, and again, this just breaks down in a bit more detail of what that actually means um, for the, what the difference is between the board of trustees, what the chair role actually does, and what the chief executive actually does. So you can have a look at that at your leisure when you receive the slides. And uh, this is actually my last slide as chair of FH Europe talking to the network um, at this meeting. So I think that really just leaves me to say uh, how honored am I to have been chair for four years of FH Europe taking it from a thought to develop the network to what it is today and, and having developed the board over the time and with the new board and certainly Magda at the helm, I know that we absolutely have the, 
the, the team to take this organization forward onto the next level, which is very much needed. And I'd just like to thank everybody, all the network, the trustees that have served with me over the time and up to today. And of course, to recognize the contribution of Gabby, um, who we lost last year, and uh, the contribution that she made around the world and a huge impact on the board as well as the network. So um, thank you everybody. Thank you for giving me the honor to chair the network over this time. And I am going to step down and become a network organization and Heart UK will always, always be part of FH Europe. And of course, FH Europe will always be in my heart as we will. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jules. And I think now we can all unmute ourselves and really give Jules a round of applause. So come on guys, let's do it. Jules, thank you. thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for giving me that opportunity. And thank you everyone for, for having me. Um, there might be a ring at your door any minute now, Jules. It's not the TV. It's something else. So please oh, stay okay. alerted. Okay. And, thank, uh, you. Oh, thank, uh, you. <laughs> thank you. And I will just, it was, it, you know, the timing is always crucial. So I will just carry <laughs> on with the presentation. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much. Whatever that ring the door is, thank you. I, I wouldn't expect anything, but thank you. It's, it's uh, don't, don't, spoil it the, don't spoil the surprise because you don't even know what it is. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. And with that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's already a tradition at FH Europe that we are behind time. We have overlap and uh, overrun a little bit. So what I will quickly do is ask you, are you OK if I whisk through the slides? We should be having a break now. And I understand how important the break for mental and physical health is, especially if you spend so much time in front of the TV, um, the screen. So. Um, Give me a few minutes and I will just go through the remaining slides and uh, finance presentation that John has kindly recorded for us. Is that okay? Thank you. I like that one-way collaboration. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, Jules has kindly mentioned about beneficiaries and the importance and why the organization has been created. Uh, and I think it's also important to recognize that we are dealing with a huge problem. Only from an FH perspective, the challenge is enormous. But so are the opportunities, because whatever we do as network correctly will, will make a fabulous impact on the community that we advocate for. Um, and I just pulled that slide uh, to remind ourselves quickly about our mission as an organization. And as a result of our interpretation of the, the, the mission and work we did together with some of you back in Zurich in January, highlight that FH Europe, as well as an organization, advocates for people with other uh, uh, um, related uh, conditions. So in a nutshell, the mission of our organization is the advancement of health and the prevention of early cardiovascular disease. And that covers uh, uh, FH, but also other uh, dyslipidemias. And in the red on the other side, you can see that we advocate for FH, HOFH, as well as other inherited lipid disorders. That's why you heard me speaking about LPLA, FCS, and other inherited hypertriglyceridemia. Um, Whenever I have a, an opportunity to speak to um, decision makers, industry, other uh, patient organizations, I always keep at the back of my mind uh, one very sad statistic. And that is that out of all the population of people born with FH, only 10% are aware of it. The 90% the around, around the world of people with FH are unaware, undiagnosed, not tested. And this is our efforts, and are not only for the 10%, but also for those who don't know that they have the condition. So the challenge is huge, but also the opportunities are uh, great. And that also means that as a network, we potentially need to look at employing 
other alternative ways and channels to reach them, to find them, to engage them, to inform them uh, so they can get diagnosed and treated. Um, I would like to talk a little about, about the capacity building. Uh, uh, as we said, the organization has got a huge challenge to tackle, and that also requires uh, uh, a, a group of dedicated people, a certain capacity to deliver on that uh, challenge. And so we have till now um, uh, addressed the, the pressing uh, urgency to identify trustees. And I'm absolutely thrilled to have such a wonderful people to guide me and to, to help me and, 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 and help the strategy of the whole organization. Um, Jules has mentioned that I officially work only three days a week, uh, but I'm extremely dedicated to the mission of our organization. So I am... Uh, putting extra hours uh, and working more than just three days. It's my pleasure and it's also my mission. Um, as next steps, it's, uh, it's important that we uh, bring on board other people. And so together with uh, Sam and Marius, we have started working on a scientific and health policy advisory group. We have identified a group of people from around the network and Europe, uh, experts uh, in, different, uh, in different areas. And so uh, we will be reaching out to those people with an official invitation to join us uh, uh, in their capacity as advisors. Also on Tuesday, this coming Tuesday, we will have first ever uh, industry roundtable because the next step is to try and build an industry advisory group. It is important that we have that stakeholder as we're present in our uh, efforts uh, for 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 uh, making sure to make sure that we screen, diagnose, and bring uh, treatment, develop the treatment that's right for our community. Last but not least, uh, it's Magda, important. Magda, please, can I interrupt? <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> These are absolutely beautiful. And for my secret pleasure, okay, <laughs> an even more secret pleasure, white brain, but don't tell anyone. <laughs> So I am happy it arrived. I'm not so happy it arrived five minutes later than it was supposed to, but I think it's still not bad, right? <laughs> it's absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And for those of you who might not uh, get the joke here, I actually once had a, a great privilege to stay at Jules' house when I was learning about the organization and I had to go to the UK and, and, and Jules hosted me at her place. And what I discovered is that she loves white Toblerone chocolate. Uh, so with that, let's move back to, to the slides. Um, it's absolutely important that we leverage the expertise and people and volunteers within the network. And I already have been working successfully with some fabulous ladies uh, uh, and gentlemen in the network. So I would like to quickly say kudos to Christina, who's been volunteering and doing a lot of work in the background. And we will be leveraging some of her work uh, uh, as uh, reports, post congresses, conferences from EAS and uh, ESC. Thank you so much. Also Bianca, uh, I'm not sure if she's here. I haven't seen her picture yet. Um, and, and, and other people, Thanos as well, expressed interest to, to volunteer. So we will be, uh, uh, one of the objectives for 2021 is to build an ambassadorship uh, 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 group, community group, and to leverage the social media, the communications and special projects. But again, as I feel now under time pressure, I will whisk through and go to the next slide. To fulfill our ambitions, we need funding. And that's why we have an extremely fabulous trustee and a treasurer. Over to John. He has recorded his presentation. So, uh, Well, good morning, here. everybody. Um, you may think that I've been off and changed my clothes, but actually this is a pre-recorded presentation. Um, I'm speaking to you uh, from Thursday afternoon. But here we are. We're now on my favorite topic, um, which is finance. And in fact, it's the most important topic FH Europe because without finance we can't do anything at all. We have ambitious plans and we need ambitious finance. I'm going to talk to you about last year's results and talk to you also about the, um, the year to date for the first seven months of this financial year. 
The last year results are still in draft. They're with the independent examiners and everything has slowed up because of COVID. But um, you know, I've got the best figures I've got and it's not gonna change very much. So here we are, here's the draft results for last year ending in February. The comparison here is with the previous year and you'll see that um, the sponsorships and donations income, the income line has really not changed very much at all, um, which I suppose is good news in a way. Um, it certainly hasn't gone down, which is great, but the expenditure has gone up because we have much more to do now. Last year was the year in which we recorded Magda and we have some of her costs in here and you'll, you'll know the impact that she's made and realize that we, we have to keep funding this. Um, the deficit last year was 33,000. Now that's okay because we had a large reserve coming into the year and we'd always planned to get the reserves down to something more like six months expenditure, which is a more prudent and sensible reserve. Um, but you see the expenditure was up 50%, so um, we can't go on like this. However, good result for the year. In order to, um, to understand that, let me show you the donations that we had. So you see there were three major donations from Amgen, Amrit, and Sanofi, and a small sponsorship from Euromedics for a meeting. You know, very good for the year, but we need to do better. Turning to this year, here's where we are now. Now we plan to move our year end for this year, so that the year will in fact be 10 months rather than 12, and this is the first seven months of that. The sponsorships and donations and the income line are pretty much the same as last year. It may not look it, but on a, on a 10 month basis, our forecast is that we will come in for about 90,000 pounds, which is month, a monthly amount similar to last year and the year before. Um, the expenditure will be higher. This expenditure does not have the cost of this meeting in or anything like that. And so while it looks like we have a healthy surplus here of 11,000, that will not continue. By the year end, you know, by um, the end of December, I believe that the net income will pre be around um, a deficit of 20,000 pounds, which will take our funds carried forward down to about 90,000 pounds or so. Now that's still comfortable within our reserves policy, but um, it doesn't give us anything to do anymore. Um, and it certainly doesn't <clears throat> give us the ability to fund much more activity along the lines that we'll be talking about later in this meeting. So how does this, um, how, do, how do these sponsorships and donations look? You'll see here that we've, um, you know, had some project money in from the World Heart Foundation, which was very valuable. Um, and we've had two significant grants from Sanofi and Amgen. But the rest of it is, is really quite small stuff around meetings. And um, that will improve, but we can't continue like this. We need to do something over the next year to substantially increase our income so that we can keep going as we are and indeed ramp up, take some of the pressure off Magda by employing some more people and do more great things. To do this, we need to look at other sources of finance. And the ones that we're thinking of at the moment are the non-pharmaceutical medical companies who may have an interest in FH, such as you know, diagnostic labs and so on. Trusts and foundations, many of whom have an interest in medical matters and um, particularly patient organizations. Public bodies like the, the European Commission, um, national governments and so on, and private donors where there's no conflict with the funding sources of the individual network members. That could be, for instance, donors in countries where we know where we don't operate at the moment. So these are all ideas. These are all things that we need to talk about. Um, but in order to meet these ambitious plans, I believe we need to get our income up by probably about 50% a year. If we can do that, then we can we can realize some of the plans that we have. You know, the rest of the day we'll be talking about what those plans are. But if you have any questions on the finance, I'd love to take them now. 
Thank you so much, John. And thank you for sharing with everyone our uh, financial health. Um, I hope it was useful. It is my great pleasure to welcome now uh, Natasha Jan from the Slovenian uh, Heart uh, Foundation. Natasha represents uh, a new member, a uh, new organization that joined only in September, uh, literally two or three days before the FH uh, Awareness Day. <clears throat> also with Natasha joining today is Professor Ur Groschle from Slovenia. For many of you, uh, 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 one of the reference names in Europe for early child screening, a successful program. Um, I dare say that Slovenia is absolutely successful, but there are also other countries that are uh, doing a great job. And I don't want to forget about all those uh, 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 successes uh, across Europe. Um, Natasha, we have given you the right to uh, share screen. Uh, how do you feel? Are you feeling comfortable? All good? You happy yes. to share your screen? Yes. Khvala, <laughs> uh, over to you. So, uh, best regards to all of you uh, from Slovenian Heart Foundation. Uh, we on Slovenian Heart Foundation are very glad to be a part of FH uh, Europe, because uh, the last three years we have dedicated our activities also to FH, and it is uh, extremely important for us to cooperate with uh, FH Europe so that we can be even better in our work on the field of HFH. I'm sorry, <laughs> it's not, not, this was not at the beginning of my presentation. Um, I will briefly introduce Slovenian Heart Foundation. Uh, Slovenian Heart Foundation uh, was established in 1991 in Ljubljana, and uh, this is an organization acting in the public interest in the field of, field of health and research in Slovenia. Um, Slovenian Heart Foundation has around 8,000 members but with activities and strong messages, it reaches at least uh, 300,000 people each year. Slovenian Heart Foundation established a network of non-governmental organizations in the field of public health, which mainly deals with advocacy. Uh, more than 80 NGOs from the field of health are now included in this network. Most important is for us is to raise awareness of members and the general public, patients with CVD. Uh, this is uh, raising awareness on cardiovascular diseases and prevention and uh, of great, uh, greater quality of life with already existing cardiovascular disease. Each year we perform many health campaigns uh, through the year, uh, these are clear uh, European Stroke Awareness Day in April and May, in collaboration with the Association of Patients with Cerebrovascular Disease. Then follows uh, European Heart Failure Awareness Day. Uh, then in September, Familial Hypercholesterol FH Week and World FH Day. Then uh, uh, on the end of um, September, World Heart Day, and in October, World Thrombosis Day, and uh, end of October, World Stroke Day, where we collaborate with the Association of Patients with Cerebrovascular Disease, and on the end of the year, uh, also in November, World Diabetes Day, where we collaborate with the Slovenian Diabetes Association. The Slovenian Heart Foundation provides activities by 11 branch offices in different parts of Slovenia. We are proud of, on numerous preventative measurements with consulting at consultation offices for the heart and also in public places like comp companies and, uh, mark, uh, and other places. Mm -hmm. Very important is also advising on healthy lifestyle and risk factors for cardiovascular diseases, 
and as well as on better quality of life when, with already existing cardiovascular disease. Every year we publish more publications, um, our magazine for the heart with five issues per year, then brochures, leaflets and posters, uh, and uh, with other NGOs, like I said before, we work on the field of advocacy. How we work? Um, we provide uh, individual healthcare education, uh, then lectures for general public and workshops for primary and secondary schools. Uh, then we have many health projects for a healthy lifestyle. Uh, our members and also non-members like uh, to go hiking and to other physical activities which we provide with them. And also uh, we have many individual consultations like uh, doctors, doctor on the phone or uh, through the website or in our publication for the heart. Uh, then we have also CPR courses and a very good visited web page. Maybe we can uh, see uh, one of the videos on the end of my presentation, if I will succeed with that. The, this um, is also in English language. Uh, we, uh, uh, we advise, uh, for example, uh, how to, uh, to lose uh, weight, how to quit smoking, uh, how to eat properly, healthy nutrition, how to be uh, enough phys physical, uh, how to get enough physical activity. Uh, it is also important for CVD patients, how to be physically active because uh, they are, uh, they have also a possibility to join uh, the group uh, physical activity. Then uh, we advise how to stop drinking alcohol and um, we always advise them uh, regarding measurement, results of measurements like blood pressure, cholesterol, sugar, uh, and advice to people uh, on existing CVD problems, um, also on FH. Um, here uh, I have some uh, data from Ur Groschel. I'm glad that he is also with us today. Um, he is a doctor from pediatric clinic and Slovenian Heart Foundation uh, is uh, very proud that we can cooperate with this clinic and with uh, Urg Groschel. Um, FH is probably the most common inherited life-threatening metabolic disorder. It is found in one of the 2050, uh, 250 <laughs> inhabitants of Slovenia. In Slovenia, we have um, about 2 million inhabitants. Um, in Slovenia, since 1995, also a population screening, screening, uh, screening for hypercholesterolemia is provided. Uh, this means measurements of cholesterol levels in children at a systematic checkup before entering school uh, when children are five years old. In recent years, um, with population screening, is discovered majority of the children with this condition. It is very important that FH screening and then primary CVD prevention should start uh, started, uh, start in, uh, in childhood. And uh, what are recommendations for children with high cholesterol? Uh, the basis is always a healthy lifestyle, regardless of age. 
regular physical activity is extremely important, 30 minutes, uh, minutes of activity a day, at least five times a week is recommended. A spent a healthy diet is also very important. For children and adolescents with FH, it is extremely important that they never start smoking. If a person with FH does not reach the target uh, cholesterol level with a healthy lifestyle, the next step is a treatment. Most often, these are drugs against high cholesterol, which are used in children with FH after 8 years of age. As part of the children's cholesterol screening program in Slovenia, at least 40 children with this disorder have been diagnosed each year, and one of the parents and half of the siblings also have FH. If uh, FH is untreated, uh, treat, untreated, the progression of atherosclerosis is very strong, and also that uh, the risk of such individuals are more than 10 times higher than among healthy peers. And on the end, some pictures of Slovenian Heart Foundation's activities. Here can we see measurements on the left, and hiking, and uh, CPR courses, then lectures, swimming, by, uh, cycling, physical activity. And uh, I hope that I will be able now uh, to share with you also one of our videos for promotion of healthy lifestyle in children and adolescents. We have made this video in the international project Children in the City with uh, World Heart Federation uh, and uh, European Football Association. Atletika je tudi zelo fajn, ker dobi zelo dobro prijateljce, kot kar je Hana. Predlagam, da se vsi začne ukvarjati s tem športom, bo imel lepo postavo. Najboljši je, s kakaj če dobere? Ne, najboljši je teč na dolge druge. Na dolge. Ne, zelo je dobro teč hiter, ker te noben ne ujave. Kaj, kaj ni? Zdaj bi igrati za to, ker zabijo zgolj pa zmaga. Lok se veza, napadalec ali pa obramba. To mi je vse se nagomet, ker igra napravi in pa še, ko padamo, je mehko. Najboljši klub je Olimpija in Real. Nagomet je ful fajn, ker se družimo z prijatelji. Obom velik bi rad, rad igral za Real. Ko za dano in gol naredim to. Tudi vam predlagam, da čim manj tehnologije, pa čim več meganja oziroma gibanja. Ko sem prvič naredil sajto, nazaj sem bil zelo vesel. Če prosim se razkancal. Logično, sej, prvič je prvič. Gimnastika je ful zabavna. Imam ful hude mišice. Nemam še punce, ki velik časa preživim na treningih in pač še nimam časa. Mi smo ful hudi!
učimo se uživati življenje in živeti zdravo. Yeah, this is all from Slovenia, from our side. Uh, Natasha, so. this has been fabulous. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah. Even even though there was a bit of a technical uh, challenge, uh, I think it's been yeah. oh. absolutely amazing. So. Uh, I, I hope the rest of the people around the table, uh, virtual table, uh, have been uh, really, uh, I, I can see, I, I could see smiles on your faces. I think it's wonderful. Thumbs up, Marta. Yes, thank you so much. Well done, Natasha. And one thing that uh, really struck me here is your um, collaboration with two other stakeholders. And one is not the usual one, uh, because in that movie you partnered with the World Heart Federation and with UEFA. I, I just quote, I used to work for UEFA, so I was super happy to see them there. But isn't it amazing that patient organizations can actually partner with other unusual suspects to deliver uh, promotional campaigns? It's really fabulous. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah. This was a campaign, an uh, international campaign, in which uh, also Spain and Romania were in, involved children in the city project. It's also on the websites. Yeah. Wonderful. And, and I will be very keen to collect all those materials as long as you are happy to share. So we can leverage those uh, from a FH Europe perspective across whole Europe because it would be great. Glad that Sam isn't uh, with us just yet because he might be disappointed that Tottenham Hotspurs weren't featured uh, and it was just Olympia and Real Madrid. Foundation. But a great job and absolutely thrilled to have you now part of FH Europe. Thumbs up to Slovenia and welcome. And with that, it's my great privilege to uh, welcome two wonderful uh, ladies from Prague. Um, uh, it was uh, partially thanks to Christ, uh, Christina from Czech Republic, who uh, introduced uh, me to Screen Pro FH. And today with us, we have Tatiana and Lucy who will present. So hello from Prague, where originally the meeting should be held. So at least somebody of us is here. Okay, so to begin with, uh, we would thank you all for joining us today. And we would also like to thank Magda for inviting us uh, and sharing information about our Screen Pro FH project. And my name is Lucy, and also my colleague Tatiana is with us here today. Hi. So I'm going, going to briefly introduce the project to you. Establishment of the project, uh, the original numbers, uh, people and countries that are uh, involved, country leaders, patient organizations, new cooperation with FH Europe. After me, Tanya is going to talk about the progress we have made so far with this project, the current numbers, and how we achieve these results. Uh, the last part is about project activities, uh, and we are go also going to show you documents that we are using with patients and physicians which means publications, our book, educational videos, and forms. So if nobody has any immediate question, let's begin. Uh, let's start by talking about the project. Screen Pro FH project is an international project for improving complex care by expanding screening, diagnosis, and treatment of FH. The project is working in countries from Central, Eastern, and Southern Europe. Uh, now let's have a look at the project's beginning. It was established in Prague, Czech Republic in 2014. We can say that the concept or the example for creating uh, this project was based on the success of the Czech and Slovak MedFed projects. Uh, here's a look at the MedFed project map of the Czech Republic, uh, where you can see a dense network of national and regional centers. And the next slide, here's the project uh, Project the beginning in numbers. So the population was over 230 million in 2014. Uh, there was eight countries involved in the project. 
uh, number of FH patients in the database was approximately 7,500. We had seven national centers and 70 other centers. And the lipid network was in the Czech Republic, Hungary, Poland and Slovakia. Uh, next, I'm going to uh, show you our project leaders. Uh, so Professor Richard Cieszka is a project leader. And we have two advisors, Professor Landsberg from the Netherlands and Professor Watts from Australia. The project is also endorsed by the IS. Uh, next is the map of the member countries. As you can see, we are, we are well established in several European and Asian countries, as well as the Middle East. Okay, now here's a brief look at who is leading the member countries, and we would like uh, to take this time to thank them all for their cooperation. cooperation. Uh, on the next slide, uh, there's a list of the countries where patient organizations are. Okay, and uh, finally, I would also like to mention our new cooperation with FH Europe. Uh, in fact, due to our cooperation, we have uh, the opportunity to be here today with you. So thank you. And now uh, I'm, uh, uh, Tatiana is going to talk about the project's progress. Okay, so thank you, Lucy. So as Lucy mentioned, I'm going to talk about the project's progress. So let's begin uh, by looking at a few important numbers. Uh, as you can see, uh, the amount of country members uh, has consistently increased since 2016. So now we have uh, 22 countries involved in the project. And so now take a look at the number uh, of the member centers increase. So as you can see, uh, the graph uh, depicts the increase in the number of centers in our member countries. So now we have two, uh, 233 uh, centers, and some of them are uh, also in development. So we hope that there will be more centers soon. But as the world is dealing with uh, COVID pandemic, it's, it's hard this year to develop more centers, I think, in all countries. And so the situation is the same, as you know. And now one last and perhaps the most important graph, which shows how number of patients in local registries has increased uh, since the beginning of the project. So now we have almost 27,000 of patients in national registries. So countries are extremely successful in um, uh, collecting data. So it is wonderful. So now, uh, uh, on this slide, you can really see how much progress we have made by just uh, comparing the current numbers with the numbers at the beginning of the project, with, which you, you can see in the brackets. So the population uh, was, uh, as Lucy said at the beginning, uh, to uh, doubled, almost doubled, and the uh, number of centers in the project is uh, now 22. Well, uh, what is also amazing is that uh, now we have uh, LDL apheresis available in 10 countries, uh, which uh, never uh, existed before. So uh, this is also wonderful. And uh, we have 12 patient organizations. Uh, some of them are, are already uh, part of FH Europe, so we are already cooperating with them. Yeah. So how, would, how did we actually achieve this result? Well, uh, we did uh, so by increasing uh, member country awareness, uh, by connecting country leaders in various countries with each other and through education, uh, which includes um, several materials and publications as well as participation at international events. For example, uh, we are participating at International Atherosclerosis Society events. We had symposium in Toronto 2018, and now we are planning to be a part of uh, International Atherosclerosis Society uh, symposium in Kyoto next year. So hopefully it will be, <laughs> will be real, not just online. So we'll see. And we also achieved this great results uh, via logistics by communicating about the project, collecting data, 
and organizing events. On the top of that, uh, by locating and involving national and quarters, uh, so we were able to widen knowledge about the project in other countries. Now, uh, the last thing I would like to show you uh, are our project activities. So first of them is our ScreenPro uh, FH website, uh, screenprofh.com. So here you can find uh, information about the project, about diagnosis, treatment options, and also some publications. So we are uh, events that are going to be planned uh, and going to be held in the future. And uh, also important part is that we are trying to focus on patient organizations. So thanks to Christina uh, from Diagnosa FH, um, we have some informational videos. Um, one of them is why we need FH patient organizations, tips and experience from Professor Cheshka, and also FH patient organization experience from Christina. And what is amazing, we have two new videos, um, again, thanks to Christina. So why be a part of the community and best check practices? So everything is available on our website, so you can uh, find out more there. Well. And also, we, uh, I would like to show you our FH book, uh, which has uh, already been translated into six languages. The original book was in Czech language, then we translated it into English version, Serbian, Lithuanian, Bosnian, and Kyrgyz versions. So maybe there will be more versions soon, because some countries are uh, working on it. So let's see what happens next. And this is also... Uh, Another of our publications uh, that was published last year in uh, current atherosclerosis reports, and it's also available online at the link. So uh, everything is on website. And finally, there are some other uh, international publications also available on website. And the last few slides I'm going to go through. Uh, examples of some of our materials for specialists and patients. The first one is FH patient card. So here you can see the English version of FH patient card in full, uh, which has also been available, translated into several languages, local languages, and so everyone can use it. I think it's, it's very useful because uh, it was uh, designed and we uh, asked countries to translate it, so good. And there are more informational materials. So this one is information for patients. Then we have a letter for relatives. So uh, this is informing relatives that a family member has a age. Informed consent, everybody knows that. And uh, for example, question for general practitioners. And the last one, uh, it's not last one, but last one in our presentation is when to consider a diagnosis of FH, which I think is also very important for uh, specialists. So I think that's it for today from my side. And uh, Lucien, I would like to thank you for your time today and for the opportunity to uh, be a part of this meeting. So thank you very much, Magda, and Paul, if you have any questions. Ask Wonderful. Us. Thank you, Tatiana, and thank you, Lucy. How impressive is that? Uh, I really would like to congratulate you. Great job. And even though we had our discussions and I've uh, uh, researched your website, there were a few things that were pretty new for me today. Uh, but most importantly, it's about the people uh, around the virtual table on this call, in this meeting. How useful has this been? Do you think there were things that you might want to uh, investigate a little bit more and potentially look at implementation back in your country? Was there any element that could be useful for you? Uh, there's no pressure if no, but if yes, feel comfortable to raise your thumb up if you think there was something that you might want to uh, repurpose. I personally thought there were at least few things that we could easily repurpose and translate. So definitely in France, I cannot see everyone there, but uh, I'm guessing there are a few more thumbs up. We had a virtual thumbs up from Russia as well. 
and one from Turkey. So there are a few things, which is wonderful. And considering that we will be looking into translations more and more moving forward, I think if there are any materials, uh, but they are not yet available in your language, that doesn't that shouldn't stop us. Uh, we should be making sure that we can actually uh, get some funding to translate and, and leverage whatever uh, materials are available already uh, for the rest of the community. Once again, congratulations and thank you so much, Lucy and Tatiana. Um, thank you. Uh, my understanding is that uh, you might not be able to join the afternoon meeting because you have another meeting uh, later on uh, with another group of people. Obviously, we will be delighted to have you and learn and learn more. And Christina, of course, we would love to have your videos as well. <laughs> Again, and thank you everyone for your uh, patience and talking about patience, patience for patience. Uh, Sophia, Sophia uh, uh, Bakuni from uh, Brussels, but originally from Hungary. She is representing FPA Patient Think Tank. And as of April this year, FH Europe is a member of this organization. It's an absolute pleasure to have you. Uh, the virtual stage is yours. Thank you so much for the invitation and thank you for, for having me here today. Uh, indeed, I'm working for FPA, which is the European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industries and Associations. So uh, just, a, just a little uh, word about this. So uh, FPA is representing the innovative pharmaceutical companies that are operating in Europe. Uh, within FPA, I'm working in the communications team. Uh, but within that, I'm specifically focusing on patient engagement and partnerships which is really close to my heart. Uh, what are we at FPA? So uh, we, have, we are a membership organization. We have companies that we are representing, but also there are national associations which are representing those pharmaceutical companies in the countries, which are also members of ours. And um, so getting to, the, getting to the gist of it and why, why I'm here today and why this is so important. So I think that there was a very strong sense in the last few years that uh, working with patients, uh, listening to patient experiences and actually working with patient organizations is such a crucial thing to do across the life cycle of a medicine. So what you see on my slide now is just a little bit of a visual representation of how a, how a medicine is developed. On the left hand side you see the R&D process and then on the right hand side you see what happens to a medicine when it goes to real life and gets used by patients and uh, how do we try to sort of trace and track what happens there and understand uh, you know the learnings from that. So I think that the most important message is that there's been a recognition uh, across the healthcare uh, sector and in the pharmaceutical industry that patients need to be in these conversations and at each and every decision point across the life cycle of medicine. Now, responding to this and understanding, you know, how, how the thinking is shifting towards the patient organizations and working better with patient organizations, FBI has introduced its patient engagement strategy. And that's an overarching strategy and has three key pillars. One of them is to strengthen FPA as an organization, ourselves, those 50 colleagues who are sitting in the FPA office, to be more patient-centric in whatever we do. The other one is, and this also means that when FPA is, and FPA might seem a little bit of a, of a far off concept because we are working on the European level, we're working policy, um, but actually whenever we write a position for the industry, we should be understanding what the patient perspective is and how patient organizations think about that. Even if we don't think the same thing, we need to hear out and understand so that we can shape our thinking better. And um, advancing the field of patient engagement is really about you know, thinking about how, how can we get this right? Because engaging with patient organizations has not always been seen as a positive thing. And, you know, there, there, are, there are so many questions around working together. So we need to make sure that we get this right and we are transparent and we are, you know, turning to the right kind of values when we, when we set the basis for our collaboration. Now, 
supporting our members, we are a membership organization, obviously we are trying to support our members in delivering their own patient engagement activities and we're trying to inspire our members to do patient engagement. Because in spite of all what I've just told you now and in spite of the recognition uh, across the healthcare industry that we need to work with patient organizations, there is still that thing which, which tells people sometimes in these very big organizations that it's easier if I do it my way uh, and not in collaboration. And I'm just, I'm just flagging this slide here because I was presenting this to my own colleagues and I said, guys, I know that it always feels like that when we collaborate and when we try to get others, others' perspectives in, we might go a little bit slower, but we might go into the right direction. And that's what really matters. So a little bit about the patient think tank. Magdalena has already um, mentioned uh, the patient think tank. I've been uh, managing FPS patient think tank for quite a few years now. It's a regular forum for discussion between patient organizations and industry representatives on the European level that are working in patient relations. Now, uh, our, our vision is to deliver better health outcomes to patients through these conversations. And however far of this sounds from practical life, actually what we can do with patient organizations is to work together and also set standards for how the pharmaceutical companies are working with patient organizations, both on the European and the national level. Now, we are also trying to drive back best practice, and I'm going to tell you a little bit later on about, a few slides away from here, about uh, the kind of guidance documents that we have co-created together with patient organizations. And it's, a, it's, really, it's really a pleasure to, to work in the patient think tank because I see um, an evolution uh, of, 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 of how we are working together as a small group. Uh, and I have to say that We've been traditionally a forum for discussion. Very often, um, the, my colleagues or representatives of pharmaceutical companies would say, I love to talk about this project or this opinion to the patient organizations, and I'm going to come and present it, and then it's going to be great, and I'm going to ask patient organizations to sign. And I think this is what has fundamentally changed, that I am seeing a different kind of mindset from my colleagues and colleagues who are really specialized on patient relations in the companies. And that's also sometimes a new function. This, this, this didn't used to exist 20 years ago everywhere. And I can see that um, colleagues consider the patient think tank and working with patient organizations in general in a different way. And what I've been asking is, when we have a position, a draft position, we bring it to the patient think tank on time, we discuss that with the patient organizations and we feed in whatever we have heard into our work. And then, and then we come back to the patient think tank and then we explain the final opinion. And maybe things, not, maybe not all the comments or all the things that have been taken up uh, that we have discussed in the patient think tank setting, but we need to be able to uh, sort of explain if it was not taken up or we need to be able to have a further conversation. So I think what I've seen in the last few years that there was increased participation from the patient organization side because we can evidence to them the value of being there, spending time. And thank you, Magda, for being part of the patient think tank because it's really impressive the work you have done, but also your active participation. And I know how scarce the resources are. I know that patient organizations actually struggle to spend time, energy on, 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 on various things. And sometimes they really zoom in on their patient community, but collaboration is really important. And I think that this is what has um, you know, improved so much in the patient think tank. We now have a co-created strategy as well with the patient organizations. We have been asking the patient organizations and the industry partners as well, what are the main topics that you want to discuss and how can we prioritize that? And now we have 
we have a sense uh, of what the group would like to see. Obviously, COVID-19 has disrupted many things and has, has required uh, sort of a, an emergency approach. So we, we have had to change our work plan and, and, and adjust it to what really mattered to patient organizations during the COVID crisis. But I think it was there was an immense value that patient organizations could actually also use the patient think tank to ask their questions, raise their concerns about shortages during, during the COVID crisis, about clinical trial continuity during the COVID crisis. These are really important um, questions. Now, uh, there are a few values, a few basic values, uh, which, we, which we keep in mind always when collaborating with patient organizations at the think tank, but also beyond the think tank. And I'm trying to really educate uh, our members, our companies, the national associations, that when we start working with patient organizations, keeping these basic values in mind will help us get it right. And there is something around the clarity of purpose, why we are doing this and what we would like to see coming out of the project. And we have to be absolutely straight and upfront about this. There is the transparency about how we work together, the transparency about funding, the independence, respecting the independence of the patient organization. And you know, also from the patient organization side, I think it's so important to have multiple sources of funding so that they can comfortably you know, navigate this space. Um, and uh, respect is, is, is an obvious one, and I don't even need to explain that one, accountability. We need to stay accountable to, 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 our, to, to our membership, and, uh, and to, to society in general. Um, inclusiveness is a very important one. And I think that the landscape for engaging with patients and patient organizations is changing. And uh, we need to be as inclusive as possible, but also geographical diversity has to be taken into consideration. And, and so there is something about uh, continuity, commitment and consistency. There is something about moving from the short-term transactional relationships when a few pharma companies are funding one certain project of a patient organization, the patient organization delivers, and then we forget about each other because of the pharma company looking into different disease areas, because the patient organization has another project with another partner. I think there is a sense that we need to make these relationships strategic long-term with true commitment and consistency. And I think that's why also it's so important to have the patient engagement function in a company because then one person can really be there, build those relationships and work with patient organizations in a meaningful way. This is just a quick overview of the various uh, patient organizations that are part of the FPA patient think tank. Uh, and again, Welcome FH Europe. Uh, and, um, and basically, I just wanted to flag quickly two documents um, that we have co-created and that we are hoping will drive better engagement from, from the part of the companies. But these are applicable for patient organizations as well. When you go and start working with a company, you can say, you know, these are the values, these are the principles for remunerating the patients, patient experts working, working with you on various projects. And I think that, the, so the working together with patient groups, the one that you see on the left hand side is really the basic principles, the, the ones that you saw before as well. And we are also trying to sort of capture the the, the barriers to patient engagement and we're trying to offer solutions to that. So maybe worth having a look. And uh, the working together with patients and the principles for remuneration, which is on the right hand side, is really trying to help sort of streamline the thinking a little bit from the side of the industry. You know, first of all, we need to recognize that patient and patients and patient experts and their carers have the right to be remunerated when they are working with pharmaceutical companies or when they are working in any other setting for that matter. Because very often, you know, patients were sitting on a panel with HCPs, with other academic experts, and everybody was actually remunerated for their, for their participation, but not the patient expert. Because of why? So, you know, th these are these are the kind of topics that we are tackling uh, within the patient think tank, and these guidances I hope 
will come in handy for both sides, actually. And uh, a little bit back to uh, what Natasha was saying, you know, about the collaborative project. So we have we have an awards um, an awards program uh, that is remuner uh, that is recognizing um, patient and industry collaborations, uh, and there are various forms of this. And it's very often not just patient and industry, but football teams, local organizations, governments. Uh, so basically, we are trying to. Um, sort of capture these good examples for collaboration. And we are trying to inspire collaboration instead of saying, because the codes and guidances within the industry for a very long time and for a very good reason, we're saying what you can't do. And I think we need to talk about what you can do. And we need to talk about how you do that right. So these are all, uh, the health collaboration guide is capturing all those projects and is showcasing all those projects that are that are applying for the health collaboration awards. Uh, and we've been there for three years now. This is the fourth year that we are having the awards. Uh, it has just closed, actually applications have just closed. Uh, and I've had the first jury panel and we have uh, a lot of inspiring stuff going on. So that's that's great. And about I just need to check there uh, for one little second, uh, Sophia. If you go back to the previous slide, I would like to mention that actually FH as a as a disease as a condition has been uh, was featured a few years back. Uh, it was a collaboration of the Swedish patient organization. So um, I know that Gunnar has successfully run that. He is not present uh, today with us on uh, this meeting, but we have other representatives. So there is in in one of those. Um, guides uh, actually one of the FH initiatives. Unfortunately this year we've missed it but we will be there next year Sophia. That's that's a deal. I, I'll I'll I'll, uh, I'll follow up on that. Uh, okay. So um, and, and just so just a quick a quick final thought on on the whole patient engagement, patient organization, industry collaboration. So I think that we've come a long way. And I think a few years ago maybe these kind of guidances were missing and, and the systematic approach was missing. But now everybody recognized the value of listening to patient experiences. And we're and I think we're on the journey to trying to get it right. And it's um it's the willingness and it's the it's the you know it's the personal commitments that really matter. And uh, and I think that I have many many really nice committed and very experienced experts on the patient think tank that um, that helped me um, do this. Um, and so um, last but not least, okay, I wanna I wanna I wanna close with a little bit of an anecdote. And um, that's a, that's a bit of a personal one as well. So uh, when I was 19, I, I moved to Budapest from my hometown to to uh, start my university studies and I was uh, all uh, very happy and very inspired and uh, very independent, uh, and I felt most invincible. Uh, and I wanted to join a local handball team, and uh, so in order to do that, I had to go for a for a general medical checkup, right? So I I just uh, I just went to the doctor. I said, "What do I need to do?" Okay, there is a blood test. Fine. And uh, so when I when I was called uh, to um, to have the results, the doctor said I have to set up an appointment, and I was like, Why do I have to set up an appointment? I'm like, It's just my blood test results. Everything is fine. And then <laughs> I went to I went to my GP, and he said, Well, your LDL cholesterol is in the sky. It's like ten times more than it should be. And I was like, That that can't be. I'm leading a healthy lifestyle. I'm 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 doing sports regularly. I don't even like red meat. What's going on? And then he just said, "Well, you know, it's probably genetic. And even if you would have been living on salad in the last 19 years, uh, your cholesterol would be really high because that's that's a different kind of problem. It's not coming from your lifestyle." And um, suddenly, I didn't feel that invincible anymore, and that was not great. And I didn't like it. And I didn't like what my doctor said, because all I've heard is I can't do anything which is fun. I just have to do everything right. Um, and that was not a good thing. And I remember coming out from the GP's office and I don't, I mean, he didn't say, 
you know, he could have said graver things, but I just came out from the doctor's office. I called my mom and I burst out in tears and I said, I'm the most unlucky and how can this be happening to me and why me? And I just didn't get it. I didn't get it that I was diagnosed on time. I was diagnosed really early. I had a good doctor who actually uh, has been working with me to set the right dose for the medication. And uh, I didn't realize that probably actually this is the best thing that could have happened to me at that point. And uh, thank you, Magda, for, for joining the patient think tank, because I think I have, um, I have been a little bit more aware that, uh, that I'm, I'm in a way a patient. And even if I wanted to run away and not really, you know, uh, live my life in any different way, I just wanted to, you know, put this problem behind me. I'm, I'm taking the medication and that's fine. And I don't even need to think about it, but actually it's good to think about it. And it's really good to be here. And thank you for the inspiring presentations from Tatiana, Lucy, and uh, Natasha as well, because it was really cool to, to see that, because I'm also uh, an FH, I'm also living with FH, and, uh, and I, I, I kind of have to be aware, and I want other people to be aware. So I thank you all uh, for, for your attention, and uh, thank you, Magda, for your kind invitation. And uh, back to you. I hope I didn't run over too much. It's tradition. We're running over time naturally. Sophia, thank you so much. Um, it was inspiring. And believe it or not, your presentation moved me to tears because it's been so true. And there are so many people, that uh, young people, that we need to inspire. And, and it would be absolute privilege and ple pleasure. Uh, feel no pressure if you wanted to help us advocate uh, uh, among uh, younger people to, to, to help them, just like you, make them realize that luck, how lucky they are if they are identified early. Um, Please count me in for the, I don't know, ambassador program, or whatever, <laughs> whatever you want to count me in for, uh, I'm, I'm in and, and thank you very much. Ishanam. <laughs> thank you so much you. ladies and gentlemen i hope this has been useful there has been a lot of practical information brought to us by um uh, sophia how to effectively and successfully collaborate with industry partners there's a lot more that we can get from those collaborations than just funding and i wholeheartedly encourage you to see this stake, uh, stakeholder group as more than just founders. There is a lot more we can get out of it. Oh, and good afternoon to all of those who joined a little bit later. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted to see young fresh, fresh blood from Sweden and also some additional people from France, our trustee from America and uh, Meryl who made it to the meeting despite those uh, recent events in Izmir that you might have heard of. Now this is gonna be the the voice is back to you. It's your session to speak, your session to share, your session to uh, get to know each other in smaller groups and with our new trustees. This is a wonderful opportunity to help them understand the dynamics in the uh, across Europe, the challenges, the needs, the uh, pinpoints, but also to share success stories. And I know that there's a lot of wonderful uh, uh, projects, models that are working in some countries that other countries can leverage. And just to give an example, um, only a few days ago, I had a chance for the first time speak to the wonderful whole team of uh, Annette France, uh, uh, and, and basically we realized that there is a, an, a, an immediate need and a wonderful opportunity to leverage examples from other countries that have successfully implemented child screening, and this is what France is trying to do. So we have actually put the French representatives into the same room with, with, other, with other people who have carried out um, uh, successful screening programs. Now, as I said, because the participation now in this meeting uh, uh, has slightly changed and some people unfortunately had to drop out from the afternoon session, in the end it might be a little bit spontaneous how everyone is assigned, uh, so, so, so bear with us. But as I said, please make sure that you share your um, challenges and successes. Uh, those breakout rooms will be facilitated 
by the trustees. Uh, so there are three breakout rooms. Um, in each room, uh, one of the trustees will be taking notes and we will try to assign everything that we hear from you in a most accurate way to one of the nine recommendations from the global call to action. The whole idea here is to try and find overarching themes across Europe that we can leverage uh, in our activities moving forward in 2021. So that's the first breakout room. After the breakout room, everybody will be automatically pushed back into the plenary session. So you don't have to do anything. Um, and then the trustees will <clears throat> provide uh, feedback, so-called report outs from the rooms. And then I will share a slide in regards to what's going to happen in the second breakout room, um, because the topic of the discussions in the breakout room will, will differ, and you will be assigned differently as well to get to, to have as many interactions with new people as possible. Now, I kindly ask you for patience and understanding should things go a little bit unexpectedly we're testing it for the first time here but i but i have a great belief in our backend team so with that i will just say trustees please remember to take notes and record the sessions have fabulous interesting conversations discussions and uh, let the magic begin yeah. so now uh how about if we get some um report outs from the room um, Joe, maybe you can go first. Yeah, happy to. I mean, we had a bit of a technical glitch at the start. It took us about five minutes to kind of get everybody into the call, but um, so that kind of kind of curtailed a little bit of our discussion in terms of some of the depths we could get into. But but certainly we um, we had a very good um, got some good insight into what's going on in Italy. Um, so Marta sort of shared around some of the focus on awareness, particularly with the relationship between patients and institutes. And um, the fact that they've done got a website and done a series of publications and things. Um, the, the impact of COVID, um, well, uh, there's obviously been an impact on COVID, I think, um, as, as in most countries. Um, and so they're trying to get organized for 2021 with some more technically advanced approaches. Um, so some of the virtual tools that we um, that are available and things like that. Mimo also shared some really great insights in terms of the, um, the, um, the status of patients um, and the, the ask of um, parliament to kind of review this, some of the status of, uh, of LP little a patients to be more akin to dialysis patients. and. The advantages of that are things like um, reimbursement uh, for transport expenses, the um, strengthening the status of permanent disability, better acknowledgement of um, of the uh, uh, the pre and post treatment sort of requirements and, and increase in allowances. But again, COVID has had an impact, and I think the concern is around it being um, uh, these sorts of conditions being. Uh, uh, deprioritized and how can we um, ensure that they are not forgotten when everybody's attention is put, is, is um, being um, put onto COVID. So that's Thank a very short you. summary. Uh, Mimo and Marta, I don't know if you want to add in, or Marius, if you want to add anything to that. Just for me, it was clear that actually the main barrier uh, is the COVID-19, uh, both in terms of uh, the uh, already scheduled activities for 2020 from uh, the patient group that uh, couldn't be uh, implemented because of COVID, but also in terms of uh, how actually all the health system prioritize the COVID patients and the chronic disease patients and cardiovascular patients have suffered from, uh, from this. And uh, uh, I don't know, for 2021 probably should be a priority to re-prioritize, uh, let's say that, the cardiovascular patients and disease, because the pandemic will continue, actually. Thank you. Thank you for that. And thank you for highlighting it, uh, Mimo and Marta. Uh, we will uh, hopefully, uh, I'm still working on that, uh, have a dedicated session on impact of COVID on, on our community. If you remember when we had meetings back in, in April and May and we were talking, you know, let's embrace ourselves and have a three, six and nine months 
contingency plan because second wave is to be expected. I think we were all so tired and not willing to think that this could continue. But uh, I think it's time to accept the fact that it's going to last for a few more months, if not a little bit longer, and there will be implications. And those are seen across the whole patient community, regardless of, of uh, disease area. So it's, it's, a, it's a good reminder that there is still a lot of work to be done so that our uh, patient community is not uh, uh, a victim of, of, of the system um, having to choose between different uh, indications because it's just not fair. And just to tell you, I saw today a post from Bulgaria from the patient organization that we that is part of our network. Uh, 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 transplantation, kidney transplantation uh, uh, units, the only one that is in Bulgaria has been converted into COVID uh, unit, leaving all the patients with kidney transplant with absolutely zero support and help. This is really, really tragic. Um, so um, thank you so much for, for that feedback, uh, Joe and Marius. Thank you so much for your contribution, Marta and uh, uh, Mimo. Dorota, are you ready to um, do some uh, reports out? Yes, actually, I'm very happy to share some information. And I have to tell that uh, even due to the fact that we lost quite a lot of time because of technical issues and trying to record, uh, we were able to initiate discussion with everybody and we captured some notes for uh, each organization, each country representative. So to, going around the nine recommendations, what I can tell, the biggest activities are of, co are of course around awareness, uh, uh, around screening, testing and diagnosis in our group and uh, around treatment and also advocacy, because here is quite a lot of related to reimbursement. So uh, shortly, in case of awareness, what uh, we capture from Latvia, Czech, Hungary, we did not have time enough from France. Uh, but it is very clear that it is a lot of activities going uh, in respect to increasing um, awareness. Uh, even if it was impact of COVID, it was possible in some well, uh, way uh, redirect activities, mostly also to social media. All countries are very much active or trying to be active on social media. Uh, interesting in case of Czech, who organize a holistic approach, what is also very welcome for such a disease. Um, in case of uh, screening, testing and diagnosis, uh, Latvia identified new patients la last year uh, in case of, uh, it is like circa 40% of all potential uh, patients identified, uh, took activities in patients' registers and uh, uh, few words about reimbursement, but I will talk about this in treatment. Uh, Czech uh, also was able to identify a couple of new cases, although very negative impact of COVID. Uh, are working on genetic testing, uh, testing with 60 FH centers in Czech. Uh, fortunately, it is reimbursed by insurance in Czech and they are doing both types of screening, what is also very good, trials and cascade. Uh, Czech is very successful. They identify 20% uh, of all FH cases by, via our patient organization in Czech and new projects started, no natal screening, collaboration with 12 hospitals, project for two years uh, as a pilot. Uh, hunger, impressive, activate cascade screening, uh, taking also physician, physicians uh, on the, uh, uh, on, uh, taking different st uh, uh, stream than via physicians who are currently overloaded with COVID. Hunger is generally collaborating with everything via additional, uh, with additional general organization in Hungary. I was not able to make in Hungarian notes, but this is allowing uh, bigger power um, on the national level, uh, also in other areas like advocacy. Uh, France uh, screening decided to create center for screening testing and this is of course main objective for France to create more information on FH and this was end of the discussion so I could not make more notes. 
In respect to treatment, interesting story about reimbursement. Latvia, reimbursement of new treatments PCSK9 um, was possible to put on the list. Still only 15 percentage for, 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 for typical FH cases. Um, Hungary, working on reimbursement. Um, happy to see a call to us to FH Europe to help really to collect all information about reimbursement in the European countries to be open to share and to, to, to let other countries to understand what was possible and in which way and what is the status of the reimbursement in other countries. Uh, Excuse me, Dorota, and you have captured that all in your notes, right? Yes. Fantastic. Because there is a lot of, I think you, you've been extremely productive in those discussions, even if it was short time. Uh, so maybe here one more comment that uh, with this uh, reimbursement approach, uh, in respect to sharing with uh, on the European level with patients organizations, what is possible is also worth to highlight whether it, it will go as an inpatient reimbursement for some exceptional patients or any other uh, paths. So really all information are very nicely requested by hunger, which I am very happy to hear. So this is, this is uh, I was not able to note more, but I can tell you that it was more information. And that's incredible in such a short space of time. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, and once again, I do recognize the challenges that you were facing there, but I will just say embrace and let's try and make it better in the second uh, breakout room. And with that, um, a, a report out from uh, our room with Turkey, UK, uh, Sweden, Austria and Germany. And basically the discussion was initiated by the younger Austria generation. Poland. Sorry, in Poland. Sorry, I'm just trying to pull out my notes while I'm doing several things on several screens. And Poland, thank you. And um, as the discussion was initiated by Alexander from Sweden, we very much focused around leveraging uh, social media and uh, digital platforms for communicating, raising awareness and reaching out. And, and um, Alexander did mention that it's nice for the organization to get its visibility to promote its activities. And we came to conclusion that it might be useful for everyone to understand that there are available free of charge or better said, available grants to non-for-profit organizations to uh, for a better search for uh, search engines optim uh, optimization and so one of those things was a google grant and um after after this meeting i will run a survey uh, because it might be interesting for a lot of you to actually leverage those opportunities for your websites and a google grant uh from google uh, to improve search uh, uh, for your website could be one of those things. We are already doing it for uh, FH Europe. Uh, Heart UK has been doing that. And, and I think it would be uh, useful for everyone. Another thing we've discussed is leveraging uh, different channels on social media for different target groups and approaching communication with the external and our, our beneficiaries direct and uh, indirect uh, through uh, different platforms. That means, uh, and Meryl from Turkey has highlighted, uh, that's what we observe at FH Europe as well, is that different groups, different communities use different uh, platforms, meaning patients very often will be using Facebook. Younger generation and maybe not yet patients will be using Instagram. Uh, industry representatives are very often on LinkedIn, whereas uh, HCPs, healthcare professionals are on Twitter. And so whenever we want to communicate with those different groups, we need to employ different channels and different messages. But it is extremely time consuming and effort consuming. And so my suggestion would be, um, and food for thought to find a way how we can um, leverage resources, uh, whether it's an agency or maybe uh, repurposing different uh, content in different languages and uh, uh, activating tools like 
Hootsuite for those who might be familiar with that, which is an um, automated calendar that actually sends posts across different social media. There are solutions. We just need to start thinking collaboratively rather than individually. So uh, rather than every single one organization within the network trying to come up with solutions and realizing that there was no money, no manpower to do it, maybe the answer is in doing it on the collaborative level. So for those of you who are interested to explore that, uh, I will be happy to hear from you. So that's the overall report from our room. Have I missed anything? John, uh, Jules, Majena, Alexander? No, I think it's a good summary. I think to, to me, the thing that came up mostly was the segmentation issue, that each country has got to deal with its own segmentation problem. Now, maybe there's some common threads, and it may be that you know, healthcare professionals across Europe use Twitter, but it may be that it varies from country to country. And I think unless we can get a handle on that, we can't really help people develop a proper media strategy. But definitely looking into media strategy and addressing it. One other thing that we discussed uh, in reference to COVID is um, COVID will be blocking face-to-face uh, -face interaction. COVID will be stopping us from going to conferences and meetings. And this is an opportunity for all of us, and not only at FH community, but for any patient community to embrace social media. And the faster uh, and braver we do that, the, the less the impact of COVID in terms of awareness and com uh, communication will be felt. So, so that's that's all from my from my side. Have I represented well our room? Yeah, we didn't go as deep as the other rooms by the look of it. Okay. Okay. So we will we will have uh, déjà vu uh, breakout rooms uh, where we will have discussions around plans for 2021. And I do appreciate that it's uh, beginning of November. Some of you, because of COVID, might not yet be able to plan for 2021. Uh, some might be actually super well organized and have already everything laid out and written down. Uh, there are different scenarios. We operate in different uh, realities, different situations. I think what the most important thing is, is to leverage this idea in the discussions and uh, share what you would want to see, what you definitely will be doing, and for us to identify any ideas for projects that could be overarching across uh, uh, different countries, depending on what we identified in the breakout rooms. So basically, we would like to hear what your plans are. And if you don't have plans, what, you, what would you like to see happening? And on that note, um, I would like to remind you that on Tuesday, we will have our industry roundtable. It's the first time when we will be bringing different industry uh, partners together. And that's also potentially an opportunity to voice our ideas, desires, and needs as a collaborative. So the more we identify potential today, the more potential there is on Tuesday to get uh, support and funding for such projects. And obviously that means uh, funding across countries so, so, so you can get the support that you need. Uh, before that, before we're going to get pushed into the um, uh, breakout rooms, I would like to share a little bit what the plans for FH Europe 2021 are. And uh, not all of that is set in stone, so there is obviously still room for, for, for uh, adjustments. Um, Speaking recently with the Board of Trustees, we identified that basically some of the uh, projects can be grouped, and those are projects that are reoccurring every year, uh, uh, annual. Those might be opportunities that come across, and they can be coming across at the beginning of the year, later in the year. They might be coming from external partners or external uh, 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 organizations. There definitely are capacity building projects and idealistic. What would we want to do if we could, and we will do everything we potentially can to make them happen? So in terms of reoccurring annual uh, projects, those are 
mostly the awareness days, awareness uh, driven uh, 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 events or activities. And the, the next upcoming one, the, the closest one I can think of, and that's how I jotted it down, is 28th of February, the Rare Disease Day. Obviously, it would be uh, great if we could work on that together as a community. Although, again, I appreciate that some of you might be not in, might not be interested in that because you might not have rare diseases under your umbrella. Um, the, the whole purpose here is to say what we would intend, what we want to do, and to make sure that we involve as many countries and early enough with the support of external funding and help as possible. So um, 28th of February, Rare Disease Day, as member or of uh, Eurordis, obviously there is now a lot of help that we can leverage, a lot of resources, tools, toolkits uh, so, to, to help us save efforts and time. Uh, the next event that is scheduled uh, is the um, uh, European Atherosclerosis Society conference. It's planned for end of May, beginning of June uh, in um, Helsinki. Um, obviously, time will show in what form it will take place, whether it's going to be uh, virtual or face to face, but absolutely uh, uh, critical for, for us to make sure that we get um, uh, 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 an opportunity there to be present as a patient organization. And then from May, June, we jump straight away to uh, September. And unless I have missed something, please let me know. I, I couldn't think of anything. Um, 24th of September, the FH Awareness Day. Uh, five days later is the uh, 29th of September, the World Heart Day. And again, if we continue with our membership of the World Heart Federation, there is absolutely a fabulous uh, a, a portfolio of activities and toolkits that we can leverage that can help us get, get ready at a, a minimal uh, uh, cost. Uh, I have also jotted down 29th of October as an idea, as a potential. We haven't, I don't think we have done it as a future before, but there is the World Stroke Day. Uh, is it something that the network would like to um, uh, investigate? Uh, I would be keen to hear from you. Uh, penultimate is FH, uh, FCS Awareness Day. For those of you who are advocating in that space, it's always the um, first Friday uh, of November, uh, and and I think it's a it's a great opportunity to for us to to leverage that day for uh, any awareness and um, advocacy campaigns, and finally uh, our annual meeting takes place first weekend of November normally. And I do recall, and I do want to check as well with you, the initial idea was that this meeting would be happening virtually. And so we would meet face to face uh, somewhere around springtime. I dare saying, I don't think it's gonna happen considering the situation across Europe. And I think I would rather, and I would love to hear your uh, uh, feedback and obviously the, the board's feedback on for the moment sticking to the uh, November time uh, and, and reviewing the situation uh, as we go uh, with, 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 with the COVID situation across uh, Europe. When it comes to opportunities and projects that come as opportunities. I mentioned earlier this morning about our collaboration with the World Heart Federation around the uh, global survey, uh, the, uh, the um, mapping survey. As a result of that, there will be uh, a publication and report written. So that's one project that is coming very soon and ha will have to be finalized by end of uh, February. Um, there has been an invitation from IAS to contribute and help with global guidelines for harmonization. So that's something that we will be investigating and I would love to hear uh, from you if you have any, any suggestions, takes, interest, you would like to um, dig into that more. Uh, last opportunity that is known to me today in terms of projects and uh, we've already started working on that a little bit with EAS FHSC so the global registry is a portal uh, find my lipid clinic it's a it's a website that uh, captures all 
treating physicians and clinics in the lipid space, as well as patient organizations. And I will not talk more about it now because we will have a spe special dedicated session on that uh, delivered by the team from the FHSC group uh, in two weeks. Uh, there will be slide about it in a second. When it comes to capacity building, having uh, seen uh, the interactions now in the network and what's happening as a result of COVID, I am absolutely convinced that we need to improve uh, the communication channels between us. Um, I know that for the past 12 months, there hasn't been an official newsletter sent out. Uh, this is purely due to the resources or lack of resources. Uh, but uh, I've already reached out to some of the um, volunteers in the network. So Christina and um, Bianca, but I'm also opening that as an, op uh, uh, an open invitation to anyone else who would like to contribute and help um, be an editor of our newsletter, because there's so much happening across the network, just within the network and with outside organizations, it's, it's almost a role in itself. Uh, having heard from different patient organizations as a result of COVID and what I've heard this, morning, uh, this afternoon from you, there is a need to leverage online and digital presence, potentially trainings, potentially uh, building the capacity there on a local and European level. So that's something definitely I would love to <clears throat> uh, uh, make a proper project for 2021. As a result of the FH Awareness Day uh, and the little hashtag that everyone was sharing, I actually came across a lot of content in different languages by different organizations within the network and outside of the network. And so um, as a result of that, um, I have uh, commissioned a, an external person to do a, a repository of content that's out there already and based on that I will be we will be reaching out to you to to ensure that we can build an online a digital library I think there is no point creating new content knowing there's already fabulous content existing and if we can translate it and localize it that the work you are doing already is incredible. Only the last two weeks, I discovered a beautiful brochure in um, by FH Austria, FH Paul Austria. Fabulous, beautiful uh, in terms of look and feel. And, and I'm sure that there are gems like that sitting somewhere on your drives and in your on your shelves, whether in paper or electronic copy. There's a lot of content that Christina is producing, Slovenian Heart Federation was sharing. Um, movies, uh, we just need to compile it and have it in one place so anyone can go and, and, and leverage and we can translate those. I think emphasis moving, moving uh, forward will be on translations. Uh, last but not least is ambassadors program. Um, I would like to take proper time and walk you through that specific project uh, on a separate occasion uh, because it takes a little bit more uh, in-depth thinking and collaboration but I am a great believer that we need to leverage people in different disease areas in different countries and in different um, languages to help us and be our ambassadors who will get proper uh, training uh, in terms of not just the disease, but what it means to be an advocate, what does it mean to engage in terms of public relations, how to engage with the industry, policymakers, and so on and so forth. And there's a lot of fabulous programs already running that we can leverage. We can already sign people up for existing trainings in schools, or we can develop something for FH Europe as an organization. Um, I will be definitely applying for funding there, and I would love to hear more detailed feedback from you you what you think and how we can build it together. So I will create a separate session on that. Finally, uh, idealistic projects. Uh, and I hope the idealistic will actually take place. Um, building on the success of the MedEasy, uh, so the online community, the educational project of young physicians and medical students that we discussed in the morning. We, we ran the pilot for the FH uh, Awareness Day, and now we are in the process of partnering with MedEasy on a, on a proper serious matter to, to leverage their community and to do educational programs uh, in different disease areas and to deepen it, uh, deepen it more. Um, there is interest from EAS 
to partake, participate, there will be the publication. So um, I will be definitely keen to share more details about it. Uh, two last things that are uh, still in the process of, of, of testing and, and uh, getting more information is Friends of Europe. Uh, it's a citizen debate. Friends of Europe is a, a citizen think tank uh, based in Brussels. They do uh, massive campaigns and debates with the politicians from the European Commission. They actually are able to pull people who are the decision makers. And they did quite a lot of things during the COVID pandemic for, for heart related, for CBD uh, topics. Now it's the time for us and there is an opportunity to build on that and leverage. Um, again, uh, I would like to come back to you with more specific details. I would like to get the, the the feedback from the industry, what they think about it, because that needs to be funded. But I think it would be great to demonstrate, to involve the citizen, but also policymakers for CVD and FH specifically. Um, and finally, uh, this is a very fresh project in terms of genetic testing and a pilot that uh, we will be conducting with Sofia Genetics about, uh, about 30 hospital centers across Europe that use a specific artificial intelligence platform and harmonize genetic testing outcomes for identifying um, FH. Uh, we're working on that with, with, with Sam. I will be communicating more details. I'm actually waiting for the results that are due uh, uh, any day now to see uh, what hospitals exactly across Europe are using that specific uh, platform, uh, estimated number out of 400 centers. Uh, it's, it's 30 uh, hospitals across Europe. So stay tuned. There will be more coming uh, your way. And with that, um, I would be keen for you to share in the breakout rooms what, what you're planning to do. One, has any of the projects uh, resonated with, with you, what you have heard? Um, how can we help? How can FH Europe uh, leverage the connections with World Heart Federation, EAS, Eurordis, and so on and so forth for your local projects? That's the most important thing. So with that, uh, Joe, how do you feel about reporting back to the team, uh, to everyone here, what you heard in your room? Yeah, I certainly can do. Um, yeah, so we, again, we had a few technical challenges, but we we persisted and, <laughs> and we managed to get some good insights. So um, uh, Marta mentioned that like every year that they'd like to take part in all the initiatives that are taking place and want to contribute to, the, uh, to and use the content for the World Stroke Day. Um, important topic for them is really around digital training and learning to use um, social media, particularly um, during because of the pandemic that's, cur that's currently uh, uh, putting restrictions on sort of face to face interactions. Um, uh, we talked about LinkedIn as being a good channel to get to HCPs or healthcare professionals, and um, they'll also be responding to the global survey as soon as possible. It's been difficult to make plans for, for 2021 because of the pandemic. Um, but having said that, um, we also talked about uh, not just awareness campaigns, but Mimo mentioned kind of more of the... Um, the sort of lobbying and legal campaign, particularly given that in the Italian constitution, everyone has a right to care, and this is particularly important for ferrous patients. So um, sort of thinking back to what we talked about in the first session about trying to get a, a, a better status for these, these patients um, uh, and, and funding, et cetera, for them. Um, we did talk about screening campaigns. Um, so those are read actually already operational before COVID, but obviously had to be stopped and likely to resume um, after, um, well, as, as the pandemic sort of comes to a close, whenever that may be. Um, Marta did mention also around, um, she had a question mark around the value of involving medical students. Um, so the MedEasy study, which I think was one of the, we also talked about, um, Marta mentioned the cooperation with uh, Lipigem um, and, and sort of creating the registry and would like to extend that to genetic testing. So, um, yeah, but that, that uh, so currently it is uh, to take a cascading approach to screening and it would like, like to kind of uh, look at alternatives. Um, 
but the implementation of those will require funding, which will be dependent on the depend the dependent on the pandemic. Was there anything else, Marius, that you wanted to add to that? I thought just that, that's to, a to short highlight, summary. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, just to highlight the the idea of digital training for the FHRO members, I think is it's very important and somehow related with this. Maybe uh, the idea of a pan-European campaign. Uh, to in order to reset the uh, European agenda next year to uh, put again the cardiovascular diseases and FHO uh, high on the agenda, I think I think would, would make uh, a lot of uh, of sense. And uh, special thanks to to Carmelo. Let's not forget that. Yeah, I was going to just say that before we moved on. <laughs> uh, with four mobile phones, three laptops, and uh, six computers in order to manage uh, <laughs> the sessions was actually the hero <laughs> of our breakup session. Very much so. Okay, thank you, Carmelo. <laughs> just and on that note, how was the interactions in the uh, French uh, uh, room? So that's Dorota, Sam, and Giovanni. Uh, actually, we got uh, a lot of very interesting uh, comments uh, because uh, because previously we were not able to fully listen the French team. So I will maybe start with some important points from uh, uh, from French perspective. However, I have to tell that it allows us to make very good link to very broad discussion in respect to screening testing diagnosis with linking also family-based care, what I think that it was majority of our discussion also with other countries. So just starting with some notes about uh -huh. uh, France, okay. it's very clear that for France, absolute priority is to raise our awareness. Only 10% 10 percent, 10 of um, uh, the whole 67, uh, 67 million inhabitants are uh, identified uh, or even 10 percent of impacted by FHCI. I'm not sure if I made correct not. Uh, however, what is very important priority is really to start prevention, prevention with children. Uh, and what also important, what is needed here is to uh, really uh, approach doctors and uh, agree on some principles. Mm. This is really very structured approach and uh, going into systematic uh, direction. Uh, in respect to advocacy in France, it is also very important that uh, France is taking activities really to build communication on citizenship uh, level. They want to approach as many uh, as much government are, as possible and also press. So this is this is very interesting to hear such activities. Uh, and uh, registers, numbers are very important, numbers of patients uh, in registered uh, in, in the FH registers. It is 7,000 people registered, good numbers, but of course, ambitious, ambitions are huge and uh, we want more. And now where is link, uh, because it was the most discussion about screening, testing and diagnosis, as I told, so starting here with, uh, with France, uh, as I mentioned, France wants to do some screening. Um, they have got very strong local specialists in genetics uh, who encourage um, to start the study, screen and test uh, children, and uh, ambitions is to screen as much children as possible. Uh, st study are completed, and what is now a big challenge is to, to convince all uh, stakeholders, like government, physicians, etc., to implement this. Um, and again, this is also about priorities at physicians, uh, and uh, not only because of COVID, but also in respect to pediatrics, where I realize that the topic which is coming is, okay, uh, we, uh, we will start systemic screening, and then what next? So for me, it was, please correct me if I'm wrong in my notes, but my understanding was like uh, really showing lack of HCP awareness, what is really possible. And it was interesting highlight here that uh, especially nutrition is so important. So should be also awareness about this should be also raised. Uh, we also touched topic about genetic discrimination, stigma on people impacted by FH. So it is important to build awareness that genetic information will improve your health. And this is linked uh, also to family-based care. Interesting comment from Hunger here. Uh, it looks that it is confusion because of running scientific discussions and 
in Hungary exactly uh, especially is no clear is lack of recommendation uh, of genetic testing uh, discussions are going into direction that uh, if you have got a gene you have got disease but if you don't have gene doesn't mean that you don't have disease so probably here it is also important to leverage some clarity about this topic and uh, Czech took uh, voice uh, and told us that in Czech genetic uh, testing is highly recommended, even uh, there are special and impo important documents. So the approach is uh, with uh, diagnosis in two steps, uh, screening biochemical lipids level plus genetic testing. And it's clear that future is going into this direction. What will allow us to improve on one side diagnosis and on another side disease prognosis? What is also extremely important for any discussion on on the local level, and again, this allow us to may, make a link to be family based care. And was uh, the request if uh, it is possible to show outcome uh, from the country level. Uh, um, this could support other countries in any national discussions to, uh, to, to, to for genetic testing to support genetic testing direction. Oh, that was a great summary, uh, Dorada. I think that <clears throat> the tension that's out there is between countries that have um, genetic testing resources and those that don't. So if you don't, I think you still have to be comfortable with working on the basis of just a high cholesterol. <clears throat> I think, uh, and, 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 so, and also, I think what's interesting is one of the uh, recommendations in, um, you know, the call to action relates to family-based care. And I think in the, the, the country discussions we had, France, Czech, um, and Hungary, that was a common theme in different ways, because in France, they want to start, uh, and both, and in Czech, start with children and use that to help identify parents. Hungary has... <clears throat> the family-based programs and there was interest from our Russian colleagues as well as getting more information on raising pediatric awareness. Um, it's probably worth um, mentioning that in this, in the international kind of FH effort related to the global call to action, which includes FH Europe, but other countries, finding children under 10 has been made the number one, you know, the, the number one, um, kind of diagnosis priority so that it's really great to hear all these efforts that are going on towards very early diagnosis. Thank you so much. And it's impressive how much you managed to get through in your room. Uh, I, I am really looking forward to collecting all those notes because there is a lot of call to action for uh, us as an organization. It, it looks like there's an, also an opportunity to facilitate exchange of good practices and information uh, between different countries. So um, over to our room, uh, what, what is very obvious that in some of the countries, because of the impact of COVID, it's difficult to plan activities for 2021. And that can be anything because of the lack of resources, uh, instability in terms of planning, uh, and we don't know what's gonna happen with COVID. And finally, uh, sadly, uh, to hear because of funding and, and no guarantee that there will be a, 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 a supply of, of of funds. Nevertheless, uh, we had two opposite spectrums. Uh, Heart UK with a very uh a uh, clear plan uh, almost uh, uh, um, um, uh, to to the day and to the event that's that's been that's been planned out for 2021. I was pleased to hear that uh, Joel said that maybe having a stroke day could be something to consider for for Heart UK. And then on the other hand, we had uh, 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 Merle in Turkey or Magena in Poland who said that basically due to the lack of resources, lack of people uh, 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 and funding, it's really difficult. So they had to narrow down down the scope of scope of work. Um, what I took away from that session is uh, one, definitely uh, potential to explore 
collaborate, not collaboration, um, advocacy with governments. So an example of the Parliament Day in the UK, and it seemed to be for some some countries something new and maybe opportunity to 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 uh, better um, understand what that means and what the benefits of such initiatives are. One, two, uh, there is a new project in Turkey to happen in regards to premature uh, MI uh, registry, and there seems to be funding for that, which is good. And, and, and Meryl is definitely demonstrating creativity to juggle funds so she can deliver on certain things. Um, uh, when it comes to uh, uh, Germany, I think the center stage will be around celebrating the, uh, the, the 10th anniversary of the organization. Uh, having said that, a lot of activities will have to happen virtually because of COVID. So I, I hear that thread here coming through digital, virtual, COVID, and, and, and what what's really uh, positive in all of that was that in Austria, virtual meetings uh, that are happening now are bringing potentially more attendees as a, as a result that maybe it's easier to access uh, uh, from, from the comfort of your home. And uh, I was pleased to hear that Austria is keen to, to, to use uh, the potential of FH Europe uh, 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 supplying the Zoom platform. So any other country that is willing and thinking, considering to do meetings virtually uh, uh, now we have a, a platform that you can use both for meetings and webinars and we have a lot of experience now running this meeting what to do and what not to do so obviously happy to to leverage that for your benefit uh, what else um, um, bum, ba, dum, bum. Just bear with me one second. In terms of uh, activities, uh, I think it's very clear in our room, they will focus around awareness raising, advocacy. Uh, Poland and Magena is planning to uh, 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 collaborate with the parliament to put on their agenda back again the child screening uh, issue as well as lowering the, um, the level in the drug pro program for PCSK9. PCSK9 access, exactly. And that seems to be a similar problem in Turkey because there was lack of reimbursement for PCSK9 that is impacting their funding there. Um, takeaways, what we can, what we can uh, maybe leverage, what I've jotted down is UK is uh, working hard on this child and parent screening and they've built a dossier and portfolio of materials, including a, a sort of a list of publications that were used from around the world. And, and Jules has kindly agreed to, to share that. So any other country running any efforts for child screening um, activities uh, 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 and, and, and could benefit from a list of publications advocating for that, it could be made available. So I've jotted it down. Anything else, John, team? Uh, just, I suppose to say with them, um, just to, to finish off with Sweden, that um, you know, there the, the issue seems to be to try and get consistency in the treatment across the country because it's, you know, it's a very fragmented system in practice, although it seems to be centralised in principle rather like the NHS. Yes, exactly. That's 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 a problem we're having, and uh, it, it's difficult to to work with because there isn't really one place you can go and try to make your voice heard and, and try to influence things. You have to sort of do it much more granularly and sort of work at a much more local level, and that's been a challenge for us. Thank you so much. And I heard the same feedback in other discussions with Finland. I heard it as well in Switzerland. So, so again, uh, we need to come up with solutions that we can reach those people, the decision makers or, or stakeholders in different ways than driving to 150 hospitals. And that's what happened in Sweden. So um, kudos for, for your uh, commitment to the cause. And I'm really, really happy to see those beautiful words, inspired, collaborative, hopeful, um, overwhelmed. Um, I would be keen to understand what's meant there. Is it good or, or, or something that we need to fix? Excited. Uh, it's interesting. Thankful, supported, uh, curious, uh, efficacious. Thank you. Uh, so efficient. And family. And I'm super happy to hear and to see this word because I know how much Jules was uh, uh, 
Oh, that was you. Because <laughs> Jules <laughs> is all about FH Europe family. See? I, so by the way, if you haven't noticed the influence of Jules on me, it's I'm sending her from Switzerland, White Toblerone. I know that it's all about family and I am now wearing necklaces like her. Can I just say, as my last parting shot is there, um, at this network meeting, can I just say a massive thank you to you and your whole team that have helped they go so smoothly with a few hiccups, but that was understandable. And But I think the agenda was great. I think the delivery has been fantastic. Um, it's been great that we've been able to still come together. And I'd like to invite everybody to uh, put their hands together and give Magda a massive round of applause. Oh, thank you. And as well, Miguel, Asha and Carmelo, Laura, Florence yeah. and Sandra. It's, it's a teamwork. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much. And yes, before we wrap, I have three minutes and I just want to say that the meeting actually continues. It's not over till it's over. <laughs> uh, what that means is we will have some external speaker webinars. So if you remember in my emails, I mentioned to you that uh, it would be too much if we did two full days of um, uh, a, a virtual meeting. That's why we actually moved some of the sessions to evening webinars. And I am super, super happy to say that the next webinar that's coming up will take place on Wednesday, 18th of November, one day before my 40th birthday, just in case someone wants to send me a Facebook message. Because last time it was um, Diana's birthday, 63rd birthday or something, and people were sending yeah. me a birthday. Mine is <laughs> the 19th of November, and the webinar is the day before. And uh, I am super, super excited to say that it's the um, FH uh, Global Registry team who will be sharing. Um, uh, Alex, now it's confirmed, the, the med, uh, project ma manager, uh, Dr. Antonio Javier Vallejovas uh, about the registry updates and I heard you talking about the registries and importance of numbers and I think it's important that we get all the latest updates directly from them what the registry has found out and how we can collaborate better with the principal investigators in the countries and then Christoph Stevens will share uh, about this platform that I uh, mentioned earlier about find my lipid clinic and how it's going to be rolled out it's going to be available in a crazy number of languages, very much localized. And then after that, uh, two weeks later, uh, we're fine tuning the details with Professor Catapano from EAS. On December the 2nd, we will have updates from the EAS uh, conference. Uh, so the therapy updates, novel therapies, and updates on the guidelines. And it might be interesting, especially for those countries that are facing variations across different regions where maybe the guidelines are not followed, and so on and so forth. And with that, I would also like to mention that Christina with Bianca have prepared summary reports from the last two conferences conferences, amazing uh, summaries that I would like to share, and I apologize for not being able to share it earlier. And finally, last but not least, I am working right now with the World Heart Federation and few other contributors to prepare a session on December 16th. Please note that those sessions will be open to the public webinars, so anyone, anyone can join, and anyone can uh, 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 listen live. And I appreciate that there are differences in when it comes to languages and language translation. So we will actually uh, uh, break it down into smaller uh, 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 contents that will be translated. So if you want that content to be available for your community in your language, whether it's Italian, French, Hungarian or Czech, especially Czech as it was supposed to happen in Prague, uh, please let me know because I am now uh, uh, trying to get some extra funding uh, for for, for translations. Our community can only live and function if we communicate to our members. So if any of those topics is interesting for you, um, please let me know. It will be all recorded, then we can post, translate it, and host it on our website. Okay. I just wanted to say thank you. Merci, vielen Dank, grazie mille, uh, spasiba, egeshegedre, uh, tak. I can't remember any other languages, but I just wanted to say thank you for contributing and it's not over until we get your feedback. So in the next days, I will follow up with a survey and I please 
wholeheartedly ask you to take a few minutes and provide your feedback because only with that we can do something meaningful and for everyone. Thank Is you. it okay? That means proceed, but question means thank you. Question. There you go. It's always learning something. Um, and I just think, as I was put on the spot last year, when we were closing the meeting in Bucharest, Giovanni, can I put you on the spot to have the closing remarks? One last sentence. The, um, the amount of um, uh, work and participation and commitment is overwhelming. So overwhelming was for me. <laughs> There is a there is a lot of uh, there is a lot of heart here, and uh, it's not a it's not a pun intended. It's there's really a lot of passion in in the people. Um, if you noticed me getting a little bit stressed out, this is a very rare occasion. I wanted to make sure that everything we could do to get recorded to to engage discussions could be done today. So thanks again to to Magda and to the team for putting this together. Uh, I am aware just how, how hard it is to, to get stuff done online. I think we have to, uh, we would like, what I would like to, to, to really encourage all of the participants is to, to keep sharing your, your thoughts and your situation with, uh, with us, with the trustees, because we are, we, are, we are rethinking the strategy moving forward and having your assessment, uh, seeing where you are now, where you're moving. We heard some of your needs today. It's also important to hear some of the capabilities and the assets that you have. We could hear them in the background, but it might be actually helpful to hear them more, more explicitly. If it's Europe, I think a move ahead in partnerships with including with you, and we need to understand, you understood also the the message from our treasurer, we need to understand how we can do this. And uh, I need to do a lot of digesting for this. There, is, there are a lot of needs that are, I would say going similar directions, but um, there's also a lot of complexity because all of you evolve in very different specific cultural and national environments. So there's also a lot of diversity here and it's not easy to find. I don't think we can find a one size fits all for everybody. So we have to do some thinking to see what can we do uh, in general. So that, that, that will take some time. So thank you again for being here today and I'm really looking forward to, to making a difference. We have um, a lot of people that uh, we need to, uh, to touch so that in a few years, we don't have to do this anymore because we will be 100% everywhere. So Hopefully. thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Keep keep safe. Keep healthy. Don't let COVID impact you. Uh, last thumbs up and I'll take a picture so we can proudly post it on social media and see what a great FH family we are. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Magda. Okay, picture. Bear with me. Smile. Got it. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Stay safe. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.